Good morning, everyone. You don't know how happy I am to see you, particularly some of you in the last minute. Um, I will give just a few words before starting the program of this uh, morning. Basically, for those that you are not being involved in the project since the beginning, what it's SHUI projects. In this project, there are 19 European, Israeli, and Chinese organizations, including two small companies. One is here with Aviva. Those are all the institutions involved in, part, in SHUI. And we have been working since August 2018 on these three major lines. First, we started building a data set of long-term experiment plus expertise and interaction with stakeholders. We made a strong effort of analyzing with different kinds of crop and hydrological models uh, ways to optimize the use of water, and we tried to integrate that, developing policy recommendations, but also practical tools like some of one will be talked today. This is the delegation of the regional government of Andalusia in Brussels. Uh, they have been extremely helpful and not also helpful, quite warm. We have been really protected by them trying to set up this. Also to the people of the CSIC delegation that we try. You realize this morning that it wasn't there, so we, we had to move it for technical reasons. Uh, I want to thank particularly to the participants in the round table you are going to give two or three days of your work or your holidays to be here, and we already enjoyed yesterday evening with you, and to our project officer, Adelma Di Biasio, who has, tried, who has tried to do the best to bring some policy officers to the round table that unfortunately, believe it or not, broke her wrist yesterday. So we, that will be one of the changes. Um, well, that will be all from me as an introduction. Just this is southern China, in a tropical area with also a lot of erosion issues that we work with in the project. Um, well, thanks for being here and our best wishes for the day. And now, Juan Jose Alarcón will be, instead of being integrated, they work together and they will be so calm to give the first talk on optimizing and using the field. Well, the communication uh, was presented, uh, was uh, eventually presented by Diego that the most of you know very well, but finally he has some personal problems and, and I, will, I will do it. Uh, our idea is to talk about the actual potential of deficit radiation sensors and differentiated species management to optimize what they use under droughts. Well, the toll index is, is one. Uh, we, before, uh, in the beginning, we, we will do some. Yeah? It's not. It's not Ah, because because they're online or something like that. Because I think that the people listen to me, but anyway. Uh, the first is, uh, we will talk about the context, uh, the context of this kind of studies. Uh, we, we will talk also about deficit relation sensors and precision relation. Well, the context is that we have a, a serious problem of water scarcity in, in the world, basically by the climate change. And it's true that in the, in, the, in, well, in the world there is a lot of water. Uh, it's about 1 uh, million, 400,000 million cubic kilometers. But you can see here is only 2% of the water. So this, this fresh water obviously is not all of them uh, uh, available for, for us. And finally, we have only a, a very, small, very small amount of water for. for uh, water resource for to to use by 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 us by by the humanity, but um, and beside of this, uh, the most of this water uh, is used uh, today uh, if, uh, by the irrigation. About the 70 percent of the total water resources that are available for us are used in the world in, in irrigation. So, well, we have a problem. The irrigation consumes a lot of water, and, and we have a serious problem of water scarcity in the in the world. So it's, it's necessary, obviously, to, to manage to, to manage properly the, the water results in, in the agriculture. Uh, in order to water to, to manage the water results, we can uh, we can mm, 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 work in, in the sources of water, superficial and groundwater resources. Uh, we can uh, <coughs> use water transfer to, to 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 transfer the water from one place to other place. Obviously, are very important the reservoirs and also some 
uh, uh, special strategies like the wastewater uh, reuse, etc. And we can work also in the demands. Uh, we can uh, improve our irrigation system by the irrigation engineering, irrigation agronomy, irrigation physiology, etc. Until 19th, the water management activity were mainly related to increase the soil availability. But from 2000, uh, the pillar for agriculture water management is more based on the demand management. What is this? Uh, uh, how is possible to, to manage, to, to improve this demand management? I think that there are two different approaches. One is the governance that is very important and, and sure that uh, uh, during the day we, we will talk about that. But also the, the use of water use efficiency tools uh, technologies. Water use efficiency uh, to technology, and this is the, the topic that I will, I will talk today. <coughs> there are different approaches when we consider water use efficiency. Uh, uh, the physiologists normally consider the water use efficiency uh, in, in a, uh, like a transpiration efficiency, and they estimate this, this transpiration efficiency like the ratio between photosynthesis and stomatal conductance. Obviously, they are more interested in to, in to, in to obtain efficient organisms, uh, new varieties, new genotypes that are more efficient in, in the use of water. The agronomists are more interested in the water productivity, that is, the ratio between yield and evapotranspirated water. And they are more uh, working in uh, the, the improvements of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the environments and the development or different management practice to, to improve this, this the water use efficiency. <coughs> well, who is more important, the, the approach, the, the physiologists or the biotechnology or the, or the agronomics, uh, uh, or the agronomics uh, strategies? Here you can see one, well, it's difficult to, uh, no, well, you can see here what is the situation. If you don't use any, any uh, an improvement in the irrigation system, the baseline, you can see that you consume a lot of water for to obtain uh, a, a very small uh, production. If you only apply via technology, uh, by technology strategies, that is uh, to improve some, uh, some genotypes and, and to use uh, some, uh, some species that are more tolerant to the water stress or something like that, you can see that for the same amount of water you obtain more yield. If you only apply recent technology, uh, you, you can see that with less water, you can obtain more production. And finally, the best one is this, to join the biotechnology and the irrigation strategies in order to improve the uh, water use efficiency in, in, the, in the plants, in the, in the, in the crops. <coughs> one uh, strategy to, to improve the water use efficiency is the application of regular deficit irrigation. That you can see here, the, the strategy, uh, the, the principle of the regular deficit irrigation is that the plant sensitivity, uh, that the plant don't need to cover all the, all, the, all the water necessity during all the phenological period. There are sometimes that it's, ne it's, not, it's not necessary to cover all the water necessities, but this is not important for the final production, for the total yield of the plant. Uh, and well, in, in SWE and, and also in other projects, but in SWE, uh, some of us, we are working in different strategies, different regular deficit irrigation, different uh, genotypes, different species, etc., in order to know how this strategy, this, this, this uh, tool is, is, is working uh, for, for different species. Uh, as, as, uh, as I told you, uh, the regular deficit irrigation, well, it's a little difficult, is based on, on, on create water deficit during a specific phenological events to save water while minimizing negative impact on yield. And with this, we can, we can have two, two different objectives. The first is to save water, obviously, in, 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 in situations of water scarcity, but also it's, 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 it's important that this kind of water stress, that uh, uh, controlled water stress that we are uh, doing, is also uh, good to improve the, the quality of the crops. And you know that today for the agriculture, for the farmers, it's not only important the quantity of the, of the, the, of the yield obtaining, also the quality of the crops that, or the fruits that we, that we obtain. 
Well, this is some uh, examples that uh, when we apply regular deficit reduction strategies, this is some, uh, some uh, different studies, and you can see that when, uh, when you apply these kind of strategies, uh, a small reduction in, in, in the, in the or some reduction in the, in the application of water, here you have relative applied water, like about uh, one, uh, 60%, only produce some reduction in relative yield of 80 uh, uh, of 20 percent. So, this is uh, a strategy that is working very good. This is some examples that we also obtain in citrus, in khaki, pomegranate, local grape, grape vein. Here is that uh, we can compare the the water, the, to the total water applied in relation in control and regular deficit ratio strategies. You can see that this regular deficit ratio strategy is normally supposed to save water about one 15%, 15, between 15 and 20%, sometimes a little more, but uh, the, the, the average is about 15 and 20% of save water. <coughs> uh, obviously, uh, this reduction of water and maintaining the, 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 the production improves in, in all the cases the the water use efficiency, in some cases, uh, you can see that this increase in the water use efficiency in regular deficit irrigation could be about 43 or 30%. Uh, normally, it's about uh, 20 also. <coughs> and the other important thing that I told you before, it's not only important to save water, it's also important to uh, improve the, uh, the fruit quality. You can see that. If you study the total solid, sol, solids in citrus, khaki, prominence, in all the cases, in um, almost all the cases, the fruits that are obtained in regular deficit relation have more quality than uh, uh, mm, that in, in, in the control plants. Well, it's not very easy to apply regular deficit relation. It's more easy to, to talk about that than to apply because there are different, uh, different uh, uh, aspect that obviously are, are, are working in this. It's necessary to study very good the soil, the culture condition, climatic, ration system, uh, obviously the, the drought tolerance, the specific period of growth of the different plant. And uh, finally, you can establish this kind of elaboration of the regular deficit, re re regular deficit ration strategies for each growth. <coughs> To apply this regular deficit relation uh, is necessary, as I told you before, to control, to study, to know very well the situation of the, of the plant, but also the water in the soil and also the climate condition. And for this, ER is very important to work with, uh, sorry, uh, anyway, with sensors. Uh, the most of you, there are, you know that there are a lot of sensors in the, in the, in the now in the market, no? a lot of uh, uh, sun in the soil, sun in the plant. We are working uh, especially in this, with this kind of sensor that is the, the sorry, uh, okay, okay. Uh, this uh, feather reproof that uh, you can uh, see that it's possible to uh, measure the water, the, the water uh, volume or the water, the, hum the humidity in the soil at different, uh, at different depths in the, in, 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 in the soil. And of, of course, this is an, an automatic system that you can, uh, you can see exactly what is the, 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 the level of humidity that we are in the soil for, uh, for when you apply recreation or apply decreation, etc. Uh, here is a, an example of the application of uh, uh, of this kind of probes. Here you can see uh, this is the, the different irrigations that we are applying. And you can see in, in, each, in each event of irrigation, obviously we, uh, we observe one increase in the water humidity in the soil. Eh? When you stop the irrigation, like here, you can see that the water humidity in the soil is, 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 is down and it's, 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 it's not, it's not uh, is, is not, uh, is, is, is down to, to zero, basically. And um, later, when you uh, irrigate again, you can see that again, you can see one increase of the uh, water humidity. So, what well, this kind of uh, data are included in algorithms and all these things, and finally, we can use this kind of sensor to, uh, to improve the irrigation uh, management. <coughs> Problems of this kind of uh, soil probes. 
Well, the main problem is that uh, the soil is a very, it's very heterogeneous. And uh, well, you, you, this, this is a local sensor that is, mm, mm, is included in one specific point. So mm, you have this orchard, obviously the, so the sensor also is only is in this place. So it's not sure if this is a, a, a good representative of all the, of the orchard. Even in the same, in the same, uh, in the same tree like this, uh, well, the, the 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 study is doing in one specific point in the soil. Uh, well, mm, normally is is working very good, but sometimes maybe there is some variation in the root distribution or something like that. And finally, these measurements that you are doing are not the same, are, are not the better one. <coughs> Another approach to, to another kind of sensors, uh, another approach to, to, to study very well the water status in the, in the plant, obviously is uh, to, to use the, the plant to, 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 to know exactly what is the situation, to measure plant water status uh, using sun sensors in the plant. There are a lot of sensors in the plant, maybe the most, uh, the most useful, the most, uh, the most interesting one and maybe the more uh, Efficient one is the stem water potential, but it's not time to talk about them. But the stem water potential is difficult to, it's, it's, not, it's not an automatic uh, uh, sensor, it's not an automatic uh, measurement. So we need uh, to, to find some sensors that you uh, can work uh, in an automatic way. Uh, as I told you, there are different sensors. Most, most, I'm sure that most of you know very well some of them. Uh, like uh, the sat flow, uh, you measure the, the sat flow in the, in the trunk of, 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 the, of the plant. Obviously, uh, some uh, uh, control of temperature detection in the, in the canopy, in the leaves. Uh, there are also le leaf turbo sensors applied in the, in the, in the leaves. Uh, and uh, also there are some sensors to measure uh, trunk growth determination, and this uh, measurements are very, very related with the level of water stress or the status, uh, stat the water status that has a plant. Well, in SWE, we are working also in this kind of sensors. We are test different kind of sensors. We try to improve them. We can, it depends of the different genotypes or different species, we, we must test uh, who or who of these sensors are, are better. Uh, it's not time to, to talk very much about uh, all of the sensors, but uh, maybe, especially in, in Murcia, we are working very much, sorry, we are working very much in this, uh, this hmm, in this trun diameter fluctuation. Uh, in the trun diameter fluctuation, you can see that here there is like a needle that is mm, close, well, close is, is in union with the trunk, and here this is a, a a displacement transducer. So the movement of this needle inside of this transducer uh, obviously is recorded by, by, by the data logger. And is, is, uh, this, this micro chains in the trunk uh, during the day are, are recorded during the day. And this is very relevant because uh, this is something like that. You know, this is the needle. And you can see that uh, uh, this is the, the evolution that you obtain uh, during the day. In the night, in the night, the 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 the, the, the trunk is, uh, is 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 expanded, and during the day, uh, with the uh, evapotranspiration, the trunk is uh, suffers some uh, small reduction in the in the diameter that we are uh, looking, we are uh, watching in in this in this kind of system. This is relevant because this micro uh, difference. This is micro uh, chains in the in the trunk are very different if the plant is well related or if the plant is stretched. Here you can see, wow. Here you can see uh, what happened with the plant is uh, has a very good irrigation. You can see that the the difference between the the measure that you have in the night uh, you have in the midday are less well that when the plant is very very stressed. Why? Because when the plant or the tree is very stressed, obviously uh, they need to, to, to use the, the, the water that they have in the, in the special trunk. If there are water enough in the soil, normally they use this water and, they, and it's not necessary that the reduction in the trunk uh, is so high. 
So again, in, in, as I told you before, in Sui we are working too much in, in this, in the same way that the soil uh, sensors, obviously all the data are, 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 are must be integrated in some algorithms and all these things in order to manage the, the aggregation. Uh, in any case, this kind of sensor, local sensor, uh, we have the same problem if we, that with the soil. It depend, independent of there are plant of water, we have uh, we determine the water status in a single spot in a single uh, spot within a plot, uh, and this is something that we can avoid using remote sensing techniques. These remote sensing techniques that are using different uh, sensors that are translated by plane or by drone or something like that p uh, permit to observe. The, uh, the water status, not only in one specific point in the orchard, you can see the water status in the general, uh, in the total, in the total, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the all the area, on, in the all irrigation area. <coughs> this is something like that. This is, uh, this is the, the measurements that you have in, in, one, uh, in one orchard or vineyard. And you can see that there is a very important variability in this, in this area that is not especially big, but there is important difference in, 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 in the level of, of, of water that are in the soil, in the cover of, uh, of vegetation, etc. So in this kind of remote sensing, we can, uh, we can see this difference, and we can use this, uh, for instance, to optimize the relation system design you see that there are some places that uh, the plant needs more water. Obviously, you must improve, you must increase the amount of water that you must put in this area and to reduce in the area that the plant maybe needs more for, for different reasons. So <coughs> this is the irrigation, the irrigation precision. And another, another possible use is uh, that is also down in, in Swiss by, by, by San Cruz that uh, maybe will be spoiled later, is the selection of, 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 of the optimum search or location. So sometimes we, 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 we told before that when you apply some plant uh, sensor, soil sensor, it's difficult to know in what plate you must uh, put uh, because the variability could be very high. So the first thing that you can do is to use this uh, remote sensing in order to know the variability that they have in the in the in the in the uh, in the orchard, and after this, you can select in what specific place you must call, uh, you must put the, the the sensor. So to finish uh, my 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 talk, uh, in this kind of activity, uh, this is some uh, this is uh, we obtain results, uh, and the results. Wow, what happened here? The results is. Uh, Improvement of water use efficiency in different countries in pillow site using the regular deficit relation strategies. Also, in Sui, in Sui we have improved the, the local sensor, plant and soil, some, uh, some different kind of sensor, in order to know better the plant water status and to mice, optimize the water use efficiency. And finally, also, we are working too much in the improvement of remote sensing in order to optimize the relation system design. The, all of this with the, the, the general objective of to save irrigation water in a context of water scarcity induced uh, mainly by the climate change. So that's all. Thank you very much. Okay. Th thanks so much, Juan Jose. Uh, since we have a fairly tight schedule, the plan is to have these short presentations and then we can catch up in the coffee break with Juan Jose, okay? So thanks again. And now the floor is to Thomas Dostal from the Czech Technical University at Prague. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I should uh, present here. Uh, well, actually, previous presentation, uh, was about uh, irrigation. And uh, we are hydrologists. I'm representing a group of people from, uh, yeah, from Czech Technical University in Prague. Uh, we are, let's say, hydrologists. 
and soil scientists, and uh, we were working uh, in uh, less dry areas. Uh, if we can do something not to irrigate, because what was presented before was uh, if we irrigate and how to irrigate and uh, how to measure it and so on. But in some cases, uh, we don't really have to irrigate uh, and if we can do something about it. Uh, so aim of uh, our activity within the project was to assess potential of various measures, what we can do, how to do it, uh, how to influence, uh, let's say, small water cycle, how to store more water in a landscape. Uh, then try to quantify these effects. Uh, then to test effectiveness of measures and strategies also for soil erosion control measures as a soil conservation. And then to elaborate catalog uh, of best management practices, uh, which is one of the important uh, outcomes of the project uh, issued as uh, Jose Gomez and team last year, uh, where those strategies are described uh, in a linkage to European Union uh, policy. Uh, what I'm going to talk here about is uh, mainly soil conservation tillage, soil conservation agriculture and its effect on um, small water cycle. Uh, we understand it as one of let's say soft strategies to reduce water scarcity and to avoid technically relatively complicated uh, irrigation, uh, irrigation uh, measures. Uh, what we considered were conservation tillage, which we understand as uh, only topsoil, shallow soil is disturbed but not plowed, not turned up, then no-till technologies and then mulching, so crop residues. Uh, we worked in both directions, uh, so field experiments and also modeling. Uh, field experiments, we used a field rainfall simulator, pretty big one, eight by two meters, on typical Wishmeyer slopes, uh, nine percent slope steepness, with a rainfall int intensity 60 millimeters per hour, which is pretty high, we know, but on the other hand, uh, the problem which are for the water in the moderate areas like Central Europe is, are those rainfall events, uh, heavy rainstorms, because if you have heavy rainstorms, then the excess of water which is not stored in a landscape is flowing out. It causes to us flash floods as we faced last week, let's say in Czech Republic, in Central Europe. Uh, and we lose this water in the landscape from total annual amount. So this is what we are talking about, this part of, of water. Uh, then our simulation was always uh, 30 minutes, uh, so-called dry run. So we are raining on the dry soil. And then after 15 minutes, next 30 minutes on a wet run. So we simulate how landscape behaves uh, when it's fully, uh, fully saturated by the water and rainfall comes what is exactly what happened in Central Europe last week, where uh, one storm by other was coming day by day, and we are really facing, people were really suffering a lot. Uh, yes. Uh, from field experiments, uh, what we can see here, I'm not going to, to go to details to the charts, but uh, if we take a follow, then you see how the surface runoff and, uh, and soil erosion occurs. And then this is the wet run, dry run, dry conditions. And then surface runoff and also soil erosion starts with some delay. Here delay is just about five to, to seven minutes. But we are talking about fresh follow, fresh follow which is compacted, so seedbed conditions. We have five to seven minutes to start here at the wet conditions, it starts immediately. And then it gets balanced. So this is the stage when a landscape is fully saturated and the landscape is not able to, to catch any water anymore. So with uh, care for the landscape, we are talking, we are influencing this part. This is what we are affecting. We can affect here in dry conditions, what will be delay, how long the 
soil is able to store the water before surface runoff starts, and then when it starts, how steep it is. Potentially, with the wet conditions as well, if we are able to store some water or not. Okay, uh, there are just some experiments, uh, some examples uh, on, uh, on the mice. We tested uh, four different uh, types of uh, crops growing, conventional, contour farming, shallow tillage, and direct seeding. You can see how those technologies of conservation tillage are able to improve soil quality, I mean retention capacity. So there is significant reduction of surface runoff, reduction to 83, which is here, between conventional and shallow tillage, up to 17 for fully for the main, uh, main growing season. Well, those three stages, there are growing seasons, like initial stage, full vegetation, and ripened vegetation. What is interesting is that the ripened vegetation is, in fact, more risky than, uh, than seedbed conditions, because here, soil crust is well-developed and vegetation is only, yeah, it's nearly dry. Uh, then we stepped over to mathematical modeling. We did much more simulations, of course, but we went to mathematical modeling to assess effects of various scenarios uh, of control measures and strategies to go to various scales uh, from plot to farm to catchment uh, to test different models. Typical way is to calibrate models, to validate them, and then to model scenarios. And then we had a testing data sets from uh, catchments in Czech Republic, in Austria, in Spain, in Israel, and in China. Well, uh, in plot scale modeling, we went to detailed modeling in 1D by very advanced physical-based model Hydros 1D, for which we use for quantitative assessment of the effect of best management practices uh, on those six test areas which I mentioned, two in China, one in uh, Israel, one in Czech, one in Austria, and one in Spain. And uh, the, the effect, again, we tested no tillage, conservation tillage, and uh, mulch residues. We indicated positive effects of mulching as the best seemed to be for, uh, well, to uh, to store most of the water. Uh, important for us was that it was uh, valid for uh, uh, all, uh, all, the, all the areas, regardless of climatic region, field crops, country, or soil type. And uh, because we are simulating only in 1D vertical flow, so uh, lateral flows and parcel sizes and boundary effects were not considered, but you see the effect is in single person, in unit, in, in single person. So we can say that's not much, but assuming that the water, that, sorry, that the soil, topsoil is the biggest retention uh, volume, or retention space in a landscape, then each single person, it's a lot of water. Uh, then we move to bigger, scale to SWOT. SWOT is soil and water assessment tool, probably the most uh, widespread model around the world. Uh, modeling hydrology, soil erosion, sediment transport, also nutrient transport. It describes a landscape uh, distributed to so-called uh, hydrological uh, response units, uh, which are understood to be homogeneous based on soil type, uh, slope, land use. Uh, and uh, it was calibrated and validated at several catchments from about half a square kilometers to 100 square kilometers in Czech Republic and Austria. Uh, what we found out in Czech and also Austria, uh, average annual reduction by 
contour tillage, no tillage, and no tillage with uh, 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 with uh, winter with uh, cover crops. Thank you. Uh, so reductions are pretty high, I would say even very high, and I will come in the very end to those numbers to interpret them. Uh, well, uh, we found it's easy to use, it's well representing. Uh, for the farm scale, uh, we modeled also um, not only agricultural conservation practices, but also, uh, also uh, landscape structure changes. In the management scale, <coughs> it also confirmed big effect up to 30 times reduction. Uh, so uh, soil conservation practices have sh or showed much bigger effect on uh, surface runoff reduction than uh, changes in land use scenarios, which was a little bit surprise, but as I said, topsoil is the biggest retention space in a landscape, bigger than water reservoirs. Then if we come to reality, how is it uh, with uh, conservation agricultural practices in Europe according to Eurostat values? Uh, conventional tillage is green, conservation tillage is blue, and zero tillage is a red. So uh, this is ordered by magnitude of, by the extent of conservation tillage. And I was searching if the countries uh, with a water scarcity, with a potential water scarcity, uh, have significantly more application of, soil, uh, of uh, conservation tillage practices. But you see Malta, Croatia, Italy, uh, nearly none. Greece, some, Spain, some, Portugal, it's very advanced. So there is no correlation between uh, application of uh, conservation tillage practices and uh, soil and water scarcity. And this is something what's uh, really very urgent because this is a change. Change in application of conservation uh, practices uh, in a up to 216, there were no better data, but uh, within last six years, last. Uh, and you see that number of countries, there is not full list, there are half of countries are missing, I don't know why, uh, but uh, there are a lot of countries which just go back to conventional, who are giving up conservation tillage and get, they are returning back to uh, to conventional tillage. If I come to results, uh, then everyone would ask for quantification. So tell me how much, what is the effectiveness? Give us a percentage. And my answer is, this is very difficult. In TV, we always hear the percentage and, uh, and, and the values, 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 but uh, Quantification is extremely difficult. Proportion, proportional retention is function of rainfall amount, rainfall intensity, initial conditions, uh, soil properties, general and also actual, and actual crop development stage. So you hardly can say that you store 50% of total water because if your rain is uh, 10 millimeters over whole day, then you store 100%. If your rain is uh, 100 millimeters during uh, one hour, then you are very happy if you store 10%. So then the percentage, what I can mention, uh, overall it can be stated between 20 to 90% for soil erosion reduction and between 5 to 80% in water retention, in runoff control you hardly can say something more precise. And the very last uh, conservation agricultural, it's definitely a way to increase landscape water storage, water availability for crops. Water which we store in a landscape is then available for the crops. That's easy, that's very simple mathematics. 
it supports soil structure, uh, hydraulic conductivity, resistance, uh, surface roughness, uh, reduces surface runoff up to 90%, has enormous potential of soil erosion control, uh, supports also biodiversity and soil biota, and farmers shall be stimulated to apply because we could see that uh, trend is definitely not just one way or positive. And uh, this is all from myself. Typical many repeated pictures from, uh, from our Austrian colleagues showing this is convention uh, yeah, conventional and no tillage, which shows perfectly well the effect. On the other hand, it's, it's perfectly well taken picture for certain amount of rainfall. If the rainfall would be more intensive, then all the field would look like that. But uh, for some proportion of landscape of, of the rainfall, you perfectly can see very wet surface here and water starts to run over here while nothing here. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks so much, Thomas. And now to give and thanks to the two speakers for the timing. It has been pretty good. And now we are giving the floor to our friend Gianni Quaranta um, from University of Basilicata. Do we have a presentation? <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. So, <clears throat> uh, I'd like to share with you this morning in a very rapid way uh, some uh, work we have done in the last, uh, in the last uh, months, let's say. <laughs> so, um, the idea is to, to, <clears throat> to have a cost-benefit analysis uh, in order to uh, understand which are the possibility to, uh, to change alternative or to assess alternative uh, agricultural practices uh, within uh, with three main crops in uh, Europe and one in, uh, in China. And of course we uh, have done this work based on the data that, we, uh, uh, that uh, are available. Um, in particular, <coughs> uh, we, uh, I mean, in, in Europe, uh, we uh, forced somehow to, to, to use uh, statistical data. Uh, at, at least we have uh, lots of uh, statistical data, uh, but uh, they are the, the official one, the one that uh, you provided. Uh, because we, unfortunately, we have no access to uh, direct information uh, <coughs> at farm level, at least we cannot uh, have uh, specific data at farm level. While this was possible actually in China, uh, they worked on uh, their uh, main crop that was uh, rice, and uh, their analysis was a more, uh, let's say, standard cost-benefit analysis that was based on uh, farm uh, data, farm uh, uh, direct collected uh, data in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in China. Um, we, uh, I mean, we use it. We try to to <laughs> to do what we uh, we could actually according to the data that were available, trying to understand uh, uh, which kind of uh, economic performance were uh, possible for the um, European farms, and also uh, through trying to understand the environmental performance. So trying to link uh, them. And uh, we also, uh, actually, uh, according to the, uh, the work of our colleague uh, Ioannis uh, Spanos uh, in Greece, we also made this analysis using uh, a cost, uh, a carbon and water uh, uh, footprint. Was the, uh, was the, the, the approach? As I mentioned, we made use of uh, <coughs> different uh, statistical techniques uh, using the uh, network of uh, uh, farm accounting uh, available uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, actually, I have to, to say that uh, um, we used the, the uh, 
2019 uh, uh, data that were the, 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 the last one uh, available. It was a huge set of data. Uh, but uh, now, <laughs> I mean, we should, uh, if we had postponed the, the analysis uh, uh, three weeks ago, the European Commission announced uh, a, a new uh, network uh, of data collection that uh, is about uh, including a lot of sustainability indicators that would be very useful, but unfortunately we could not account on them in, the, in our analysis. So we uh, made use of uh, different uh, uh, statistics technique for the, the um, in order to find, I will show you some results later on, um, Kind of trying to find uh, the sustainability uh, among different factors and uh, of production, but also uh, um, the sustainability uh, among uh, environmental factors and economic factors in order to find to improve uh, to uh, give more efficiency to the, the, the system. For the um, carbon and footprint analysis, uh, it was based on. Uh, let's say, uh, uh, standard uh, technique, uh, very, I mean, known uh, uh, technique with algorithm made, uh, calculated uh, uh, and, uh, on, uh, I mean, current uh, literature, the, the leading literature. What was the, the, the model we, we, we used? We <coughs> have uh, calculated, computed uh, 31 uh, indicators. Uh, indicators uh, were calculated based on the, the data available, uh, of course, at, at uh, EU level, and we grouped these uh, indicators in uh, uh, four, five uh, uh, classes, five uh, dimensions. Uh, these were uh, were uh, sustainability uh, indicators set, or at least, I mean, we grouped all the, these indicators uh, in uh, in a way that uh, put together all the sustainability. Uh, mm, indicators, uh, then uh, also indicators uh, from uh, uh, the economic, so about the, the, the economic uh, results, uh, also uh, farm assets and structure of, of cost, uh, and also subsidy and uh, any kind of incentives to produce uh, uh, that we have in, in Europe for the, the production. Actually, in uh, this analysis was also corroborated uh, with a uh, uh, sample, well, not uh, a really representative uh, sample, but just to have uh, some, uh, uh, you know, uh, at least to, to, to increase uh, our uh, uh, com confidence in, in the results that we get. So we also uh, distributed uh, a questionnaire in uh, both in Spain, in, in Greece, uh, and uh, in, uh, in Italy. The same questionnaire actually was used also for uh, uh, the same time collecting also information for carbon and uh, water footprint. Uh, I mean, the, uh, just uh, um, no. The um, the what is the, the the analysis that we uh, performed? We performed the analysis, as I said, in Europe within uh, with the three uh, these three crops. Uh, there was olive, uh, uh, grape, wine, cereals. In as I said, there was a rise in. In, uh, in China. Uh, we are here going to, to present some results just for olives because they, they, they also for time constraints, but uh, I mean the results just to, to, to show the, the approach and uh, some findings <coughs> for the olives while we, uh, I mean, remind for the, 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 the deliverables that are almost uh, ready uh, for <laughs> 5.6 and 5.8 for uh, the shoe, I mean, deliverables that we are preparing uh, at the moment. Uh, so, what is the, 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 the first one is how to, to have the, the cost structure uh, uh, analysis or uh, some, uh, the, some of, the of the results. Uh, not surprisingly, actually, but uh, I, uh, it's good to, 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 when we go inside, this uh, that could be a trivial analysis saying that, uh, look, uh, according to the, the input, the cost of input, uh, there is a general uh, decreasing. Uh, we move uh, from the classes, from the economic classes, uh, uh, going, uh, growing. Uh, I mean, we have a slight reduction uh, in, the, in the cost. 
this means, uh, I mean, uh, it's really nothing very new on that, although uh, it's not true for all the inputs. And why I'm stressing uh, this aspect? Uh, because we uh, are looking for uh, substitutability. I mean, if we can, uh, inside this, um, with this approach, uh, we try to find if it's possible in order to have the same economic results, uh, to substitute some inputs, some maybe environmental friendly uh, inputs, uh, with, uh, we can substitute them with some others input, uh, for example, uh, labor or, or innovation techniques or, or uh, so on. The first thing that we, I mean, uh, the first very uh, basic uh, result was uh, <coughs> that this uh, was uh, almost uh, true for all the, 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 the regions that we analyzed. And we find that this, I mean, slight, there is a kind of, uh, according to the, the farm sites, how we move from the, this is uh, just a show. I mean, there's not, nothing, uh, no, no numbers here, no figures here, just uh, to see the trend. I mean, uh, so the input, the cost input are decreasing, slightly decreasing with uh, uh, um, farm sites. Uh, this is, a, this is a, I mean, as I said, could, could seem a result quite uh, uh, trivial, obviously, uh, because they, we can experience some economy of scale, as we say. But if we go deeply in this analysis and uh, find to, to, to see the behavior of different indicators, uh, in, uh, we find some, uh, not surprise, but at least uh, I think it's very interesting from the economic point of view. As I said, we based the analysis only on olives. The first uh, surprise, let's say, uh, was that was, uh, I mean, uh, strongly statistically supported, so very, uh, uh, that for example, for the fertilizer, uh, for the fertilizer, we both, I mean, the share of uh, cost of fertilizer according to the farm sites uh, is increasing, I mean, as the, the we move from, uh, uh, I mean, uh, small farms to bigger farms, the uh, cost, uh, the, sh the share of uh, uh, fertilizer cost increase uh, first, and then increase also the amount of, not only the cost, because maybe the cost could be even linked to some other stuff, although strange for, for the, the, the sites, but also it's, it's uh, interesting that also the amount of fertilizer is increasing with farm sites. And this was observed, I mean, all over the, 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 the regions that we, at least according to, I mean, to the statistical data. While, for example, other uh, uh, crops, uh, oh, sorry, other uh, uh, costs uh, were I mean, slightly decreasing. Of course, the, 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 the general results, uh, including also the water, was uh, the, a general reduction. Uh, but uh, here, for example, you can observe that uh, the other inputs, machinery, energy, even though the energy was, uh, I mean, just uh, at the border of the statistical significance, but at least for the, the other, so the, the other input cost, they were reducing according uh, to uh, as we move uh, from smaller to uh, bigger uh, farm. So in, th in this case, and uh, uh, I mean, if we put all these uh, uh, together and saying, okay, this, let's, say, let's uh, take in, uh, uh, in mind, uh, I mean, these uh, results, when we move to uh, anal a multivariate analysis, trying to find relationship uh, among different inputs. Uh, and this, uh, I mean, the, 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 what we can observe in this case that, is that everything is actually linked to uh, the water because the, 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 the water, the input, I mean, uh, the, 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 the support or the, uh, the, the given by the water is completely different. So in the olive uh, sector, what we can uh, observe for sure is that the different inputs have a different behavior. I mean, according to the farm size or even for the physical size of the farms. And, uh, uh, but the water is uh, moving in a, different, uh, in a different way. I mean, in, in actually, in uh, economic terms, we should, in strictly economic terms, we uh, observe it, I mean, that, uh, this, uh, that we, as uh, 
production function regarding the, the olive trees. The, the production function of the olive, olive uh, uh, grow in, uh, in Europe uh, have already uh, used uh, all the potential that uh, we can gain from the fertilizer for, and also from uh, the, the, the uh, crop protection, machinery, and energy. We are at, in a way that uh, <coughs> we, the, the, the marginal productivity of these inputs uh, are almost uh, decreasing. Means that uh, we already explored all the potential of this uh, input. I mean, uh, we used this input in order to uh, increase the production. And we, according to, I mean, the, 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 the set of uh, uh, fertilizer and crop protection, we almost used, uh, I mean, the, 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 the maximum that you can use. In other words, in order to reach, for example, better results of better, um, uh, higher production from these, uh, uh, using more fertilizer, for example, we should use always more and more fertilizer in order to have the same amount of increasing in output. While this is not true for the water. So the water is the only input, actually, that uh, can still... Uh, I mean, we can, uh, uh, if we use uh, a, a, a more, an extra uh, liter of water, we uh, get a better result than the previous liter one. Uh, I'm not sure that if uh, I was clear, but just saying that the, 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 the water uh, marginal productivity is still increasing in uh, olive uh, cultivation in uh, Europe, while the other inputs, fertilizer, and uh, have already reached the day, let's say, not maximum, but uh, the, the, the highest uh, marginal productivity that we can get. So to have uh, uh, more uh, um, product, let's say, to increase the production of, of olive, uh, we need to, I mean, we can use uh, a little bit more water rather than fertilizer. So, I mean, the, the, this is the, 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 the results, let's say, or the in, 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 in street economic terms. How, from where we observe these results? This comes from the uh, kind of sustainability analysis. I mean, the, the question was, can we substitute uh, some of the inputs uh, uh, among them in order to build, for example, uh, management practices that can be more adapt or more uh, uh, sustainable in some way the uh, the answer is uh, uh, i mean <laughs> is yes if we can account on water where we can have some sustainability and the, the unfortunately the the answer would be no if we cannot have access of uh, on uh, on water resources even for the 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 the, the olive uh, uh, production in in southern uh, uh, Europe. Uh, in, uh, at the end, uh, I mean, just to uh, mention another uh, uh, analysis that we, oh, sorry, uh, too fast, uh, just, I mean, just, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, no. So? Okay, it was just, yeah. no, it was, uh, no. Okay, okay. No, just to the the, the, the last, uh, uh, I would like to mention something in the end of uh, another model that we applied for uh, or it was the um, the PCI in order, in order to understand the the the, the possible uh, uh, environmental gains uh, using uh, some. I mean, trying to uh, to observe. I mean, uh, according to the data we we analyzed uh, to see uh, when uh, olive grow is uh, together with some other crops, uh, uh, which are the possible, uh, let's say, environmental gains. And actually, we observed, uh, according to the uh, PCI, the principal component analysis, that when olive was uh, in, the, in the same farm mixed, for example, with the livestock or with agritourism, we can reach uh, much better environmental uh, results uh, 
even this was uh, also uh, true, I mean, all over the, 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 the Mediterranean side. So there is a, 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 a part of uh, olive culture in, in southern uh, uh, Europe uh, that are trying to, to gain environmental, uh, I mean, results, uh, trying to, to, uh, to uh, mix uh, olive culture with some other uh, uh, crops uh, or even activities in the in the farm because it's, it seems that is the only way that we can reach these uh, uh, results. Moving uh, to the uh, okay, this was the, the just uh, some picture of the the, the, the plots that we uh, we uh, use it. Uh, uh, we can uh, okay already stress uh, this. Uh, my heart now goes to to Johannes who is. Uh, no, no, just a few, few slides. No, no, two, two slides. My, to Yanis, who is uh, suffering in one of the island bay uh, at the moment, so he sent us these uh, two slides <laughs> about uh, uh, suffering under the sun. I mean, I mean, he's not suffering at all <laughs> on the beach. No, I'm joking, of course. So uh, he uh, performed this uh, uh, carbon and the water footprint. Uh, uh, analysis. He actually sent last night, uh, sent me some notes on it because he was expected to intervene today, but unfortunately he, he could. Anyway, I mean, <coughs> the, 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 mes the message I think he, he would like to, 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 to share, to send us, was that uh, uh, the, the analysis he performed was uh, based on the different, uh, uh, in case of water, different uh, kind of water for the footprint and uh, in reality this was uh, quite trivial for the, for the green uh, uh, water because uh, most of the olives, especially in, 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 in Italy and Greece, they are rain fed while pr most of the irrigated uh, uh, olive cultures uh, stay in, in Spain, but these are the, the results that I'm, I'm sure that you can uh, find much better comments in the, in the <laughs> deliver that he is going to, to prepare. Uh, at the end, the, very, uh, the last one, the last slide uh, from Ioannis uh, was, uh, I mean, the, the, the main message was that uh, olive is still uh, very important for the, the carbon footprint because it accumulates more carbon that is uh, uh, going to, to, to uh, um, eat in the, in the environment. So, uh, and this can be even improved uh, according to different techniques like uh, uh, pruning or if you, we use uh, I mean, uh, all the, 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 the technique that we can still, there are some uh, possible, uh, I mean, strategies to improve uh, the, uh, or to reduce, I mean, the carbon footprint of the olive uh, uh, group. I'm sorry, but I, I know, know many other comments from uh, this uh, uh, part of the slide. So, thank you. Thanks so much, Gianni, because we, you have taken a difficult part of the project in the last months, not only today, you and Rosanna. So now I'm very happy to see that you are here and also that you are healthy, uh, Gabriel. And well, I'm pretty sure you're going to give a pretty nice presentation right now. Thank you, Jose. So good morning, everyone. First, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the people who really did the work behind these slides. It's Shannon Leroyce and Louise, they are present here, and uh, Michael Bechtold, so these are the three core people. And then we have other people who help, uh, Dirk Kras, who is also present here, then Zenko Heivaert, Jonas Mortelmans, Samuel Scherer, and Maxime van den Bossen. So it's a whole team, because you'll see we achieved a big uh, step. Several regions in Europe are currently thirsting for water. There's too little water in the soil, and consequently, uh, they're suffering a reduction of biomass. And I think I need a pointer. Uh, here you go. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. So think of the south, think of the Po Valley uh, regions in Spain, which are currently having an agricultural drought. So that's why we want to look into regional applications. Um, we will monitor these processes via regional modeling, but also via satellite data. And ideally, we want to combine both the models and the satellite data via data assimilation. Okay, my pointer, here we go, data assimilation. So, a little bit closer, okay, thanks. 
So that's going to be the first part of my talk, talking about regional modeling and satellite data, and then we will look into the future, see what our irrigation needs will be under different climate scenarios. So to start with the regional modeling, uh, we use AgroCrop, which is a field-based model, but we extended it so that it now can be run at a regional continental scale. In that process, we converted it from Pascal, the source code Pascal, to Fortran and made it ready for open source distribution. I'll come back to that later. That regional system has been tested with several different meteorological forcings over Europe. Um, reanalysis data from MERA2, it's a NASA based product. Also, reanalysis data from EasyMap, um, which has multiple different models behind it. And in addition to that, also climate forecasts. So, reanalysis is looking back uh, in history, forecast is looking forward. We evaluated the regional system in terms of soil moisture and biomass, and then having assured ourselves that everything works well, uh, we could then predict uh, future irrigation requirements. So AquaCrop version 7 uh, will hopefully be launched at the end of this month if FIO, FAO approves. What we currently have available is a version controlled Fortran code available on GitHub. The link is there. If you would click on it, you cannot access it yet uh, because it's still password protected until it'll be approved. Related to that, there are three types of applications which will be available to all of you. Uh, three standalones for three operation, uh, operating systems. So Windows, uh, Mac, and Linux systems. Then there is the default graphical user interface, which allows you to manually play with AquaCrop and run simulations at a single field or point. And then the big upshot here is that we implemented AquaCrop inside NASA's land information system, which also allows you to assimilate satellite data, run uncertainty estimates, um, estimate parameters, do a whole variety of uh, applications. So we'll look a little bit into our first results with these regionals, regional uh, systems. Here you see um, one growing season of aquacrop simulations of biomass. On the right hand of each pair of panels, you see aquacrop simulations. On the left hand side, you see satellite estimates of biomass. So it's the Copernicus dry matter productivity product. You see that biomass is growing. We are in July here, August, and then it's declining uh, by the time we get into October. It's nice to look at these maps. Now we compute some performance metrics from taking those pairs of data, and then we compute a correlation, anomaly correlation, an unbiased RMSD, a bias, and this is a total available water storage. This is a, a soil texture um, information, as, in essence. You see that the correlation is really high. That's, of course, because of the seasonal pattern. Um, here you see an example at the Hoal catchment with simulations and observations nicely following the same seasonal pattern. So correlations are high, anomaly correlations regionally are high, in other regions they are lower, for example, because texture may be off or um, we didn't simulate irrigation. Um, but still, anomaly correlations tell us something about the interannual variability. So one year you may have more biomass than another, um, and so in general it's, it's good. Then other metrics, uh, I'll leave you to look at it, just to tell you that we looked into different metrics to evaluate biomass, this is at one kilometer resolution. We also used in CQ data of soil moisture and satellite data of soil moisture. Here is an evaluation of a regional simulation over Europe at a 50 kilometer resolution using EasyMap input data as forcing, and it's evaluated against SMAP soil moisture retrieval. SMAP is a microwave mission that gives us soil moisture estimates. Here the unbiased RMSD is computed and it's around the uncertainty of the satellite data. So that's telling us that this uh, model is performing reasonably well, both in terms of soil moisture and biomass and different types of um, forcing data. You already see some gaps here. That's because satellite data are not always everywhere available. Um, and that brings me to the second part. Uh, we also have satellite observations. So in the previous slides, we used the satellite data to evaluate our model. Now, the model we know is uncertain. On the other hand, we have satellite data, which, which also gives us regional data, they are also uncertain. 
Currently, there are about 4,000 active satellites orbiting our Earth, of which about 1,000 can be used for Earth observation. And I've circled a few here that uh, observe either sun moisture or, ve or vegetation via microwave uh, signals or optical signals. And what we use right now is Sentinel-1 because it has uh, a fine resolution, one kilometer, um, and it detects both vegetation and soil moisture together with an active sensor. We will now use the satellite observations together with the model uh, because we assume and we expect from literature, of course, that the combination of both models and observations would give us the best estimate of soil moisture and biomass. So how does this work? So we start at a specific time in the beginning here and we let aquacrop run forwards and you see different lines, that's for the uncertainty. The model has a certain, it has some uncertainty. Whenever the satellite has an overpass, so when data become available, we stop for a second, we assimilate, we ingest that satellite data, we correct our model, uh, we restart it and then let it predict forwards until we get to the next time step when there's a new satellite product available. We compare both the observation and the simulation. We weight both based on their, their uncertainty and we just uh, let the model further evolve. That's the idea of data simulation. You see also that at each time step when the satellite is available, the uncertainty reduces. So now let's look at how that looks like at one single time step. So at each single time step, we produce maps of all the different variables, soil moisture in different layers. This is a top layer, this is a deeper layer of aquacrop, and also biomass. This is one snapshot in time. Associated with each of these variables, there is also an uncertainty estimate. Here is an example of the uncertainty on the biomass at this particular day. Now let's look into a time series. This is at the Howell catchment. But, uh, the top plot is again soil moisture. The bottom plot is biomass. Uh, the, the red line is a model only, without any data simulation, so no satellite data evolved. The red line is where we do assimilate Sentinel-1 data, so microwave data. I'll spare you the details, but we're really assimilating microwave signals, so we need to translate that microwave signal to soil moisture and biomass. And so that's what's happening here, for example, the red line is the open loop, the data assimilation pulls the biomass towards the right value. So this year, that means the biomass is higher than the model predicted. The next year, biomass is actually lower than the model predicted. On top of that, you see that the uncertainty, so going from the red plume to the black plume, the uncertainty decreases, which means that at each time step, we have the lowest possible uncertainty in the data assimilation system. See, these are all nice features. Let's again look at one snapshot in time, now over northern, northwestern Spain. Top row is again soil moisture, bottom row is biomass. It's really a zoom into a particular region. Uh, so this is a soil moisture at the beginning of April. The satellite passes over and you see that it observes the left-hand side of this area. That means at that, over that area, we update our soil moisture and we can update our biomass. And associated with that is a reduction in uncertainty. So we have a reduced uncertainty in our soil moisture estimate, and we can thus make better decisions. On the right-hand side, you see the increments. So that's how much water was added or subtracted from soil moisture by Sentinel-1 at this time step. So most of the time, water was added here. In terms of biomass, there was also a little increment. You see a little change in uncertainty because, of course, in the beginning of uh, April at this location, there was very little biomass, probably very little uncertainty and little room uh, for improvement. That is how the data simulation works. Um, again, we reduce our uncertainty. We have better estimates. So normally, we should be able to make better decisions on water use and also foresee where we will have uh, yield reductions or uh, lots of yields. That's for monitoring agricultural processes right now. If we look into the future, uh, we get climate change and maybe uh, we can run our system to then estimate net irrigation requirements. We all know that CO2 emissions um, may keep uh, rising in the future. 
there's many different scenarios possible depending on the politics, right, and decisions that people make. We can have an, an unmitigated, unmitigated increase in CO2, or we can have just high emissions, or we can have a mitigated scenario. For these three scenarios, um, we used five different global circulation models. Those circulation models, they use um, the carbon dioxide, but then they compute all of the meteorology, so temperature, uh, precipitation, all these other variables. So five GCM. GCMs are for global uh, circulation models. And three climate scenarios. And then for two times in the future, the near future, so 2030 to 2060, and in the far future, that's the end of the century, we computed what the difference would be in net irrigation requirement. Net is how much water you actually add to the soil, and you don't account for all the losses. On the left-hand side, you see the near future. The right-hand side is the far future for the different rows or the different scenarios. And it's clear that with an unmitigated scenario, we have a lot of uh, a net irrigation increase, and all the stippled regions are uh, regions where that increase is significant. So in the worst case, that's all over Europe. Normally in a mitigated case, it's um, mainly significant in the southern countries. Now here, this is millimeters per month, up to about 60 millimeters per month. If I put this in percentages, because Thomas already mentioned, we want to see the numbers, percentages compared to the current status, uh, we see that in a case of, for example, high emissions by the end of the century, we would have an increase of 30% irrigation requirement. Um, that's total amounts. Over the years, the variability in the net irrigation requirements will change as well. Um, you see again the same setup of the plots, um, near future, far future, and what's what is striking is that in the, pot in the northern part of these plots, it's all red, and the bottom part, it's all blue. That means that in the northern countries, we'll have a higher variation in our net irrigation requirements, so we'll have more extreme droughts, meaning that we'll have a higher variation in irrigation requirement requirements, whereas in the southern countries, there will be a sustained dry climate, so they'll have to irrigate basically every year, right? So the variation will decrease in the southern countries. Now, I have to make a big scientific disclaimer here. All the results that I've shown are, of course, very uncertain because they come from global circulation models. Uh, we see the, globe, the, the trend, right? The more we go to an unmitigated scenario, the higher the irrigation requirement. But if you look at the individual global circulation models, there's a lot of variation. So you can have like almost double as much uh, in one model for an irrigation requirement than for the other. And what I've shown you was the median, or here is the average of the requirements. Um, so again, um, these results depend more on the global circulation model than on the climate scenario itself. So to conclude, in case of a high emission scenario, we'll have 30% extra of net irrigation requirements by the end of the century. This is computed over the summer months, right? The interannual variation will increase in northern regions because we'll have more extremes, whereas in southern regions there will just be sustained need for um, irrigation. I hope I have convinced you that we added a really cool new tool to your, to your toolbox, uh, which is AquaCrop version 7 in different um, applications, and we implemented it into the NASA land information system. It's the first crop model that's used in LIS. It allows you to use any type of flexible input, so meteorological forests can be changed, soil and crop parameters can be updated. Uh, it gives you the possibility to do spatial data simulation over any domain at any resolution. You can include different types of satellite data. We use Sentinel-1. Um, now, what can it be used for? for? For example, for early warning of yield reductions due to drought or diseases, for example. And in the end, we hope that this will help to improve guidelines for water use. Thank you very much. Well, 
Thanks so much, Gabriel. It really fits into the, into the day. And now we go to the last talk of the first block. And I look into Ian, and he's going to, to talk also about that. You're going to change the topic. Yes, thank you very much, Jose. I hope that can be heard adequately by those online as well. Uh, so, um, this is going to be something different. I realise that I'm the only person standing between you and the coffee break. Uh, so, hopefully, this will provide a little bit of a personal perspective on the nature of this particular project. Uh, I think it, it's appropriate that I give a personal perspective. Uh, thanks to political events, I am no longer European, uh, and, I, and I can assure you that I'm not Chinese either. Uh, so you could regard this as an independent uh, personal perspective. So in looking at this particular project, it is a somewhat unique funding mechanism. So the European Union has provided four years of funding uh, to the researchers in the room, which comes to a close uh, at the end of next month, as you can see by the blue bar here. Our Chinese colleagues, on the other hand, have been independently funded by the Ministry of Science and Technology. And you can see that they started their funding six months into uh, the Shui project, and they concluded six months early. So what this has meant is that it has been sometimes difficult to get uh, thorough engagement between the European Union researchers and our Chinese colleagues, particularly at the start of the project and indeed towards the end of the project. I will say it's been a somewhat interesting uh, four years uh, in science. And if we think about the way we were used to working uh, when we had our kickoff meeting in Cordoba and then our second kickoff meeting in Fuzhou in China, extensive uh, use of uh, field work where we, which we used for training opportunities for our early career researchers, all that came to an end very abruptly with this particular uh, virus. So we've pivoted from a, an almost complete reliance on in-person uh, ways of working through to a complete reliance on online ways of working. And I think as we move towards the back end of the project, we have taken some of the benefits of the online way of working to try and ensure we get greater engagement of a range of partners uh, in both in-person and uh, online ways of working. So what I would like to talk about are initially are just a few different models of EU-China collaboration. The Shui project is one particular kind of collaborative model. I want to talk a little bit about the cropping systems we have worked in. You've heard a lot from uh, some of the other speakers already this morning about that. Uh, some reflections on how we communicate or exchange information. Um, the, the publications that have been, that have resulted from this particular project, which for me has been um, an outstanding level of productivity. I emphasise the word productivity and I think it's contingent upon all of us to ensure that this productivity actually translates into impact. Hence the need for events such as today where we, we are engaging with our stakeholder groups. And, and lastly, I want to consider future possibilities and possibly dare to make some recommendations on how we might use this learning process of the last four years to ensure better uh, engagement within the future. So there are a number of different models of, of EU-China collaboration and I guess in my career I've, I've benefited, benefited from a number of different types, including more unilateral exchanges and I want to talk briefly about a project I was involved with um, that overlapped to a limited degree with the Shui project uh, called the So Reap project. I want to talk also about truly bilateral projects. One's focus on capacity building and this is a Newton-funded uh, project by the Royal Society in the UK, and then also reflect on these joint R&D projects uh, such as Shui. So, so reap, uh, you will of course realise that the key element when designing a project, be it European funded or, or other funded, is to get a good acronym, okay? And you'll see considerable agility of language in coming up with an acronym that truly reflects 
uh, the nature of the project. So at the risk of uh, getting tongue-tied, our project was addressing food security, environmental stress and water by promoting multidisciplinary research, EU and China partnerships. So reap, and I think that gives, gives a nice sort of agronomic context. So the aim of the So Reap project uh, was built on the fact that typically there has been substantial numbers of Chinese researchers spending significant amounts of time within countries within the European Union, within the United States, within the UK. What we wanted to do within the So Reap project, and we received some significant funding to do this, was to actually turn that interaction uh, in, in reverse, to actually ensure that European researchers spent significant amounts of time in China doing their research. And we were very ambitious. We wanted to ensure this at all uh, levels of, of science, from both early career researchers to midterm researchers to uh, principal investigators. There was, of course, a, a sort of sliding continuum of funding available in the sense that the early career researchers spent much more time in China than the principal investigators, but there was funding provided at all levels uh, to do that. And we would think, well, why might we want to do this? And there are some clear opportunities to do research in China that are perhaps unique. A lot of the laboratories there are incredibly well resourced. They have significant infrastructure funding available, usually from the Ministry of Science and Technology. So some of the anal analytical procedures that I would really struggle to, to undertake within my own laboratory in Lancaster were very easy, at least in theory, to do within China. I say in theory because often within China the infrastructure is provided, and this might be a state-of-the-art you know, multi-million uh, RMB facility, um, but often the level of technical support is not always there. And that's why this kind of funding was particularly attractive to our Chinese colleagues, to actually get um, technical expertise into some of their laboratories to help them set up uh, protocols and run instrumentation that otherwise they may have struggled to access, even with the best commercial uh, intentions, and training courses provided by companies that sell this instrumentation. So we base the projects on existing bilateral long-term relationships. So generally, Chinese principal investigators that had spent either their PhD time or postdoctoral time within European or American laboratories. And, and I think this was quite helpful because those researchers in China had a very good understanding of the ways of working uh, for European PhD students, particularly. I would say the SoReap project had variable success, uh, dependent on the level of engagement between the visitor from Europe and the Chinese host. Typically, we found when our Chinese host had spent time in Europe uh, and there was, there was a good collaboration and communication between the host and the visitor. What we ensured was that there was a cohort of early career researchers from Europe that went to China. They went to different laboratories, mostly in uh, the southeast of the country around uh, Guangzhou. And certainly by having a cohort, it helped our researchers adjust culturally within the country because they could meet up on a regular basis. And what was imperative, uh, as we discovered, was they would not go unless their funding was actually tied to spending time in China. And so this was a mechanism of the collaboration that you might, ask, you might argue was very difficult on the researchers, but was absolutely essential to fulfil the mandate of the funders, uh, which was the, the European Union. And so I'd like to pay tribute to some of our early career researchers who you know, gained their PhDs by spending at least, well, up to two years in China while being based at a European laboratory. And we, we graduated a number of PhD students from a number of institutions uh, as a result of this collaboration. So in terms of a, a bilateral um, way of working, I've been involved with a, a project that's still ongoing. Um, 
Interestingly enough, and this shows the independence of funding schemes, as far as the Chinese authorities are concerned, this funding has finished. Um, as far as the Royal Society is concerned, we have extended this for the pan because of the pandemic for a number of years, and we've still got work ongoing within this particular project. So this project was aimed at forming new bilateral relationships, and so I partnered with uh, a colleague who's now the, the, the Jose's uh, offsider, uh, principal investigator within, within China, uh, Wei Feng Shu. And so his particular expertise is in, in the molecular biology of root system growth. I guess my particular expertise, and you may debate this, is a little bit to do with agronomy and crop science. And so we were interested in how um, the riser sheaths, so soil that, that adheres to the root system, how that actually forms, and whether that is important in uh, improving plant drought tolerance. The aim of the Newton Advanced Fellowships was particularly to allow the uh, Chinese, in this case, although there are people from around the world who have taken advantage of this fellowship scheme, to come to the UK to develop new project directions. And so what this has meant was that Professor Xu's uh, lab group has spent time in, in my lab for up to three months to acquire new skills such as, uh, you know, high throughput measurements of plant hormones, uh, quantification of, of riser sheath development. Again, I think this project has been successful, um, but it, I would stress there has been variable level of engagement according to the particular researchers that have actually been placed in my laboratory. It's interesting that if you go to Professor Shu's laboratory, there'll be this one particular form on the wall that indicates the timing at which each individual researcher in the laboratory is expected to produce a new paper, okay? Now, science doesn't always work like that, in, in my laboratory at least, um, and I, you certainly want to cultivate significant independence of the researcher and get them to develop their own ideas. So I think le different levels of uh, independence versus, if you like, command management, um, contribute to the, the level of engagement you might get from a visitor uh, coming to your laboratory. Nevertheless, I think it's been, you know, incredibly successful in developing this area of research within uh, his laboratory and we, we're hoping for continued funding of this via another mechanism. This, of course, leads to our own project, the SRAE project. Uh, again, you'll appreciate the relationship between the acronym and the title of the project. Uh, and here we wanted to exploit existing and also form new bilateral relationships. I think this has been quite tricky because of the funding mechanism uh, within the Ministry of Science and Technology. For, for them, it has basically been business as usual, relying on existing work that's been ongoing in their laboratories, but supplemented by this additional funding to allow Chinese researchers to participate uh, via travel and subsistence funding to engage within the project. As you would expect, if the principal funding mechanism relies on travel and subsistence, and with COVID preventing that as being a possibility, I think it's more been more difficult to get genuine active engagement of our Chinese researchers, uh, particularly during the time of the pandemic, particularly in the cases where they've not been able to come into their own laboratories to work, let alone travel to Europe to work with, with us. So there has been, I would consider, much more engagement via online platforms. You can debate just how useful some of this online engagement has been. Nevertheless, as the pandemic has taken its course, there have been opportunities for research exchanges. Often these have been funded by, by other sources and I think they've been uh, really valuable. And I would just like to you know, pay tribute to a couple of early career researchers from uh, China that have come to my own laboratory over the course of the last uh, year or so. One's now doing her hotel quarantine back in China, having escaped from the, the COVID-ridden plague of the United Kingdom, okay? Uh, and she's at the end of her three-week hotel quarantine uh, back in China. So these two researchers came to work on uh, projects related to some of the objectives of Shui, looking at uh, a form of irrigation known as partial root zone drying, uh, looking at the relationship in, in rice between 
irrigation frequency and, and riser sheath development. And I, I think these researchers were, were, were very brave uh, culturally uh, in the sense there is always a significant um, you know, level of personal engagement required to uproot yourself from what the ways of working you know and go to a different laboratory, particularly when you don't understand the language very well. I think they've been even braver when you consider the rather different approach to COVID regulations in China and the United Kingdom. So, you know, full credit to them and, you know, they've, they've done some interesting work. I'd now like to uh, turn to, to cropping systems and you probably can't see it in this, this map of China here, but there's some information provided on the major crops uh, within China. Clearly, as we go from the uh, southeast to the northwest, there's a significant water scarcity gradient. And so a lot of the uh, European or Mediterranean cropping systems that we might be uh, working on sort of fall within this sort of heartland of, of China as we go from the southeast to the northwest. Of course, rice is always going to be a crop of significance to Chinese uh, researchers. And obviously, it's quite difficult, at least in the northwest of England, to provide the sort of facilities you would want for growing uh, rice crops. We, we have managed to do that with um, temperature control greenhouses. There are certainly some similarities where I think there's been good translation of results between the EU and China, particularly in relation to cereal rotations. Uh, in some cases, uh, our Chinese researchers, logically enough, want to work on important local problems, uh, such as concerns about water scarcity for rice cropping. It's not always been possible within this project um, to pair partners with the same uh, field-based cropping systems, but we've, we've tried our best to do that. Communication uh, is, is, I think, always a challenge, even within, uh, within the European Union. Our, our language skills do, do vary. Um, it, I think it's exacerbated, particularly when we uh, work in countries like, like China. Um, to a large extent, this has been mitigated by the newer generation of Chinese researchers, particularly those that are early in their career that are highly motivated and want to maximise the gains in terms of acquiring technical expertise and different ways of working from being in engaged in a European Union project such as this. The other element that's challenged us uh, in terms of communication has been the project website. Uh, I think we were perhaps a little naive uh, thinking we could have one website that would be uh, compatible with both English, Spanish and Chinese as the three uh, main global languages uh, worldwide and I apologise to my local hosts uh, for, for making that particular statement. Um, as it's turned out, uh, we quickly needed to adapt our ambition to ensure there was a Chinese res uh, Chinese um, named website for our project because within China our European Union website domain was often blocked. Um, I'm not certain why I would have thought that the content we had provided for the website was not likely to be blocked but there were challenges of, of, of operability here. Um, certainly we who are at PI level recognise that when we go to China there's often considerable attendance by early career researchers, whether that's voluntary or compulsory. Perhaps I haven't really got to the bottom of that. Um, but I think what's been unique about this particular project, and I think it's been, uh, you know, part of the transition to, to working within a pandemic, has been that online training environments can really enhance participation within the project. So within the project, we've had a series of, of webinars and other online ways of working, and I realise a number of you have contributed to, the, to that. And this has been particularly valuable, and I think something that in future our Chinese partners will expect. As long as we can timetable the meeting at an appropriate time, there is the opportunity um, to ensure that those that can't attend in person can actually attend the meeting. Having said that, I still think there's an important role for bespoke, um, in-person, somewhat more technical training. So the, perhaps the first example post-pandemic that we managed to achieve at Lancaster in that was we um, got a, a, an invitation from 
uh, Delta T devices who manufacture some of the instrumentation that uh, Juan Ho was talking about this morning. And we set a series of objectives that were sort of quite technically focused to uh, calibrate and maximize performance of certain instrumentation that Delta T had provided, understand the theory and practice of different sensors, uh, and run bespoke software to visualize and analyze the data uh, from some of these sensors that has provi were provided. Now, with this particular workshop, we were limited by current COVID regulations in Lancaster to no more than 12 participants. Our, our Chinese early career researchers had joined the lab by that time, so they were able to participate. And what was particularly interesting was they, was they said that in China, we would not have the opportunity to do this. If there was such an event scheduled in China, there would be 100 or more researchers there, and we wouldn't get the care and attention to detail that such a bespoke um, course was able to provide. So uh, some learning there. Publications, uh, I think this was one of the first, uh, Jose led the, basically setting out the ethos of this particular project. Uh, this was one of the first of, of many. And it's interesting that our two groups of researchers within the European Union and China have basically been very loyal to their funding source when they come to publishing uh, their work. There are, I think, five papers that mention both uh, funding sources. The other thing that's quite interesting is when you do an analysis of the areas of which um, this project is published in, there's um, more than 50% of the, the publications from the EU are sort of looking at the bigger picture in terms of uh, environmental sciences and water resources um, within China and possibly this reflects the, um, the productivity of our, our coordinator in China, Professor Xu. There's huge emphasis on plant sciences and also agronomy. So some differences there, but I think we have attempted to try and ensure complementarity of approaches across the EU and China. So my final slide, because I can see they're preparing the coffee uh, out there for all of you. I think what's critical to ensure success of projects like this and is to ensure that they do run for the same duration and there is much more equitable funding. To some extent, we have capitalized to a large extent on collaborating with very successful Chinese researchers that already have substantial Ministry of Science and Technology or other ministry funding in their laboratory. This has worked to some extent, but clearly we are piggybacking on an existing funding, on existing funding mechanisms that they have, and what that has meant was that sometimes it's more difficult to you know, change the, the type of research that might be done. I, I think what will be really valuable in the future, and possibly such a mechanism exists, is for there to be flexible and competitively awarded funding allowing true bilateral mobility within specific projects uh, such as this. So clearly, you know, the Chinese early career researchers that came to my lab were funded by other sources, Chinese Scholarship Council or, or provincial funding. Uh, I think at a European level, if we're going to continue to engage with China in the way that this project, and I know there are other projects in the past and others will in the future, I think there needs to be a specific um, funding mechanism of the kind that we employed within the SoReap project to ensure that if European researchers want to go to China, there is the opportunity to uh, put in a specific bid and apply to work for six months or 12 months in a specific laboratory in China. Uh, and lastly, I think, you know, and any project is a, a learning process, w there needs to be much greater awareness and perhaps alignment of, of funder expectations. And I think what's possibly the best way to indicate this is this true level of impact versus publications. I think within the European Union, given the, the nature of the funding that is designed to try and provide answers to sp specific environmental challenges, impact is always emphasised. That's why we have meetings such as this. I can remember even before the Shui project started, going to China uh, as part of another visit and talking to a group that was going to be involved in this project. And they gave a very nice presentation about their work. And my first question was, well, this is fantastic. 
how many times do you meet with farmers to tell them about this? And there was large discussion, lots of getting out the phone, making sure that the translation was in fact accurate, okay? And the ultimate answer was, well, we haven't told farmers about this work yet. Um, and hopefully with projects such as this, um, it provides a, a roadmap forward in terms of indicating how important the work that the research work that is being undertaken is in terms of informing and perhaps altering uh, farmer practice. Because I think that's what the, um, the mandate for this particular kind of project is. I would emphasize that you know, there, are, there is a lot that we also within the European Union can learn from our Chinese colleagues in terms of farmer engagement. So certainly within this project there's been a large number of events, perhaps fewer than we might have expected um, because of the pandemic where our Chinese researchers have not just talked to you know, half a dozen farmers, they talked to hundreds of farmers at a time and demonstrated techniques that will address problems of uh, soil degradation and address problems of water scarcity. So thank you very much. I hope that's been an interesting uh, reflection. Uh, and do tweet or Facebook or whatever you young people do um, when it comes to, to this particular project since we're in the room together. So thanks for your time. Well, thanks so much, Ian, and everyone else in this morning. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I, to apologize, first, my, my talk starts with, uh, uh, with an apology because uh, I mm, mm, forgot to mention also Julian. Sorry for, uh, for this. Um, so I skip this uh, this part because uh, it's uh, already uh, it has been already addressed during the first part of the discussion this morning. I just want to add to the uh, ma major global societal challenges the agricultural sector is facing, the uh, management of natural resources are, uh, is, uh, is facing in the, during this uh, uh, harsh time, <laughs> I, I would say. Uh, apart from the water scarcity, the uh, problems uh, with, the, with the soil, soil erosion and so on, and the climate change, of course, I would um, um, add other two uh, major problems uh, that we are experiencing in, in Euro Europe, but uh, I would say worldwide. Uh, first of all, there is a, a, a kind of trade-off between two main processes. The intensification from one side and the, uh, of the farming system, of course, and the uh, um, agricultural abandonment, the abandonment of the land. And this is a, a very crucial point, and these rise, uh, from these there are, uh, can uh, emerge threats, but also opportunities that should be uh, mm, somehow uh, addressed in a, in a policy uh, consortium. And another problem uh, we are dealing with is the um, um, uh, el elderly index that is uh, going worse all the time. This, the age structure of the European farmers that are uh, increasing the uh, polarization of the uh, um, agricultural structure and is, uh, uh, um, and is making uh, even worse the concentration phenomenon, the concentration of the, of the land use. So, and, and, and the other part, we have experienced such a problem during the COVID uh, crisis, the uh, urgently need for uh, hired labor, both skilled and not skilled, in, in the agricultural sector. The policy context, very few words. We are uh, in, a, in, a fa in the phase of uh, um, uh, the new programming phase, so the new uh, policy, the new agricultural policy will, be, will enter into force uh, in uh, uh, 2023. Um, there are two main uh, in important changes. From, uh, um, first of all, the mechanism, uh, the, deliver, the, the new delivery model, so um, the focus shift from the uh, uh, results to the outcomes, that is a very important change in the, uh, uh, in the, in the, in the functioning of CAP. 
so the, the member states have to provide strategic, strategic plans. And then the other uh, uh, important changes is the introduction of a new uh, the eco scheme, a new tools that together with the uh, conditionality and together with the environmental um, and climate uh, uh, friendly uh, measures and investment should uh, uh, aid the agricultural sector, the European agricultural sector to address the Green Deal uh, targets and mainly those stemming from the farm to fork strategy and the biodiversity strategy. Uh, Another point that I, I would like to stress is the changing context. We, uh, we, uh, Shui project <laughs> as a witness, uh, two big uh, uh, um, problems during along its uh, duration: the COVID and the, now the uh, uh, the war. And these these are the the uh, words of the uh, EU Commission that. In the, in the revision of this strategic plan is saying, okay, pay attention, we need to uh, refoc refocus our uh, decisions uh, because we uh, need to uh, can counteract somehow this new situation. Uh, so we need to take in, a, in, a, in account the link between climate action and food security that is uh, uh, becoming a very crucial uh, issue. Uh, so uh, the stress has to be on uh, uh, increasing the uh, sector res uh, resilience and to uh, um, uh, reduce the dependency on fertilizer use uh, and scale up the production of renewable energy without undermining food production. That is a, a, a very... Uh, important point to, to, to be addressed. Uh, and then trying to apply sustainable production methods. Uh, so this is the, 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 the scenario, let's say. Uh, Shui Project has provided, uh, as uh, already mentioned the, in, the, in the first part, several, um, a, a very huge, uh, I would say, suite of technologies and, and tools to address the optimal use of scarce soil and water resources. And this has been done, it has been done at uh, infield level and uh, at larger scale. And also uh, this um, uh, analysis has embraced also the social and economic parts, trying to provide a, an overview, a, a very complete overview to the, the stakeholders, uh, addressing both technical and economic. Uh, aspects. And the, the, the project tells us that uh, best management practices can provide, although with some uncertainty, like uh, Thomas uh, mentioned before, and I think it's uh, an, an important aspect that you mentioned before. Uh, but in any case, best management practices can be, a, 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 can provide uh, good uh, tools to the to address the, the, the problems, but we have to take in mind that uh, there are trade-offs between different ecosystem services, so the best management practices should be adapted to the local conditions, and also that we have to exploit the synergies between um, uh, different sustainability goals. So we have to take in account that the farm can be, or the landscape level better, can be uh, the place where uh, different um, sustainability goals should be uh, sh should be um, uh, how to say managed uh, in synergies, not not uh, in in conflict. Um, so very few insight that I I hope that will be uh, useful for the uh, for the uh, round table. Um, as Jani has said before, uh, we have uh, seen that. Uh, there are economic efficiency gain uh, along the economic gradients of farms, but not environmental, actually, not environmental, environmental gains. Uh, and this means that, and, and confirm what uh, I was saying before, that uh, the uh, smaller farms are less competitive uh, than the larger one, of course. 
And this is a, a, a very important point because they are the they role in managing natural resources and provide economic and social basis for the local communities are uh, endangered by their, their market uh, uh, marginality. So uh, I know that is quite trivial, but I think it's, uh, it's important to stress that uh, uh, diversification and alternative economic uh, uh, exploitation of natural resources had, uh, has to be pushed and boosted in order to overcome these this, uh, this problems. And the focus group revealed the importance of strengthening farmers' position within the food chain. Uh, the, they are squeezy. <laughs> the, 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 the squeezy phenomenon is, uh, is uh, uh, already ongoing. ongoing. And this, uh, and uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in particularly in this, uh, in this moment when the costs of the input are growing a lot, uh, if we don't, uh, don't have any control uh, 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 on how the value is uh, 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 shared among the different actors of the value chain, the cost of this increase will uh, remain on, only on the sh uh, shoulder of the, of the farmers with the danger for the, for the sector. So one of the solutions can be, of course, the short chains and uh, the uh, um, and the uh, increase in use of uh, uh, organization in order to overcome the uh, mon mono uh, mono monopoly of the uh, um, that uh, is uh, typical of the uh, distribution and the industry, the, the, the last part of the, of the food chain. Um, Another aspect that emerged from our analysis that, uh, is that the labor and uh, the other costs are driving land use changing. So, for example, in Spain, drone, uh, sorry, the, the stone trees are replaced by olive uh, groves. And this is a, a very an important issue because we are, uh, we, we are experiencing how the, the, the linkage between agricultural sector and, and industry sector at the national level. So if we want to provide this, this link, and we want to <laughs> make uh, this link fu function in, in, in the future, we need to pay attention uh, at this kind of substitution at the local level. So we, we need to pay attention to these land use um, changes. Um, other aspects are, are have to do with the, for example, lack, lack of flexibility in the water allocation. We were uh, talking before about the lack of management at landscape level. I think this is a, a very important uh, aspect, the, 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 the possibility to have a, a landscape um, uh, um, appro approach instead of uh, uh, just mm, mm, uh, managing uh, an allocation based on uh, first come, fir first allowed. Um, then uh, 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 very uh, um, uh, um, um, for some, fa for some farmers, uh, some farmers have uh, uh, highlighted the importance to have uh, uh, affordable, uh, in affordable way, critical input, inputs such as, for example, the crops that have to be uh, used for cover crops or, for example, the availability of technologies that are uh, tailored to the local conditions. So this is, uh, uh, this is another uh, important aspect to be addressed. So the uh, importance to have uh, technologies that are well fitted to the local conditions. And this is another important, th 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 um, uh, involves a, a, an idea of innovation that uh, take in real consideration the local needs. So the operational groups that are uh, an instruments that are, have been introduced by in the last programming phase should be enhanced should be promoted in order to um, uh, grasp the real needs at the local level. Um, another aspect, uh, very few uh, 
uh, seconds. Stakeholders have emphasized that uh, the farming system needs time to adjust to the new conditions. So maybe uh, the, the, the policy programs are sometimes too short, uh, too short. And also um, the, that administration, apart from lowering the administrative burden that is uh, an issue all the time, but the administration should set a clear policy, clear rules. The example is, very typical example is the, the use of glyphosate. Uh, uh, um, so there is a need for a long-term perspective. And the, for example, the eco scheme are um, uh, uh, thought as a, a, a one-year scheme. So this is, can be a weakness. Uh, so we, the, the land managers need predictability and need a long-term cer certainty in order to implement measures optimally and invest as needed. Uh, oh, sorry, it's not really clear. Uh, polarization, the structural polarization. Many, lots of, of very small farms, bi big farms from the other side. Uh, the, in this case, uh, Cooperative approaches can be one solution. Collaborative management approaches can be a, a, a solution that can, can somehow can address this problem. Collaborative agri-environmental management has been introduced in, into the, in, into the uh, previous, uh, in the actual uh, programming phase, but should be encouraged. Uh, more because can provide environmental benefits, can provide because the ecosystem services are, uh, um, <laughs> um, are acting at catchment scale, at larger scale than the, f uh, not at the farm scale. Economic benefits are uh, evident because if uh, uh, there is a management uh, at, uh, at uh, landscape level, cost can be shared by the, the farmers. So uh, this can, can be a, a, so a solution or at least a way to address the problem of uh, uh, economic dimension, little economic dimension. And also there are uh, social benefits, uh, okay, trust, uh, relationship, exchange of information, peer-to-peer, uh, um, uh, exchange. So it's, uh, um, in my opinion, or at least the literature tells us that this, the collaborative management can be, uh, has to be uh, exploited more in order to address the macroeconomic problems of the sector. Um, um, some insight coming from the papers that you have uh, 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 are uh, the results of the, that are synthesizing the results of the SHUI project. So in some um, study areas, there are uh, um, the less experienced farmers are st uh, still uh, not applying the uh, BMPs, the best management practices, because they uh, are um, they feel the complexity of the, um, the, of the best management practices compared to the uh, conventional ones. In this case, there is a, a scope for improving the training of young farmer, younger farmers and linking maybe the, the, them to the more experienced farmers. It, this was introduced into, into the uh, last programming phase. This should be uh, or could, could be uh, reinforced in order to promote these uh, uh, um, linkages bet uh, uh, between generations, among generations. Um, and for sure, um, the on-farm demonstration is a, a very good tool. The peer-to-peer -peer, uh, exchange has to be uh, promoted uh, more. Um, so, uh, uh, I, I, uh, I already expressed this, uh, uh, this idea to capitalize on and exploit the results of the operational group and also boost up the new settings in order to uh, foster, to uh, 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 hide the, the 
co-creation of innovative solutions that can uh, be um, best uh, fitted to the, local, uh, to the local conditions. And also the soil and water conservation can be proposed as a business model, especially to young farmers. So change the narratives, say that we no, don't need to maximize production, but we need to uh, uh, um, decrease the, the, the cost of production. So change the mindset. And uh, very, the, the, it's the, the last one, I promise. <laughs> the um, a few recommendations. Uh, provide a, um, a, a, a incentivize practice that contribute to a, a holistic transition uh, towards more sustainable farming. Um, and not just uh, promote uh, simple efficiency gains. It means not, uh, not uh, uh, move from uh, an environmental efficiency perspective to a sustain sustainable ones. It means address not only the economic aspects, but also the, the uh, sorry, the environmental aspects, but also the economic and social ones. And implement multidimensional sustainable schemes. It means uh, not just one uh, best management practice, but a, a different ma management practice that together can be, uh, can exploit synergistic relations. And of course, the, uh, uh, for the problems I mentioned before, the, the payments should uh, be accurately mm, uh, proportionate to the um, to the uh, uh, cost farmers are facing in order to implement this, uh, this, uh, this measure. And of course, especially in the, with this new approach uh, uh, foreseen by the new CAP, there is a need to avoid overlapping between the schemes. So uh, trying to uh, um, uh, um, uh, assure the correct functioning of the different schemes at farm level. So that's all. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, mm, uh, thank you for your kind attention. <laughs> Thanks so much, Rosanna. And now, if, the, if you kindly can come to the place that I already see you before. <laughs> When my friend Peter told me 20 hours ago that I need to round to chair this round table, I'm not an expert in irrigation, just a humble expert in soil and water conservation, whatever that means, I started to be worried and read. Um, one of the things that is pretty clear, not because of that, when you work in agriculture today, there are two or three issues related to water that are happening simultaneously in different perspectives. One of them is that, one of them, I was involved in the Spanish plan of desertification some months ago, is that in agriculture in many countries, not only the Mediterranean, access to water can make the difference to a farm as a business. And simultaneously, it's a resource that is finite and there are many issues related to how we handle that. And what has striking me in the last months I start to read out of curiosity is that the interest in irrigation is showing up in countries and places that you, you never realized it was happening. Just read the other, Delaware is a small state in the eastern part of the USA, but they increased the irrigated area from 2.5 to 10% in 10 years. So it's, it's not going to be Almeria or Murcia, but it tells you something. So my, the idea of this round table is to take advantage of these four fantastic members of the panel that we are going to enjoy. And the first, I'm going to give five minutes, so it's five, four, three, whatever you want, to introduce yourself and raise what may be the, a key point 
on the overall issue of how to optimize the use of water for agriculture in a broader perspective. And I'm going to start with Miguel Barnuevo. He comes with several hats from the community of irrigators or uh, Union de Pequeños Agricultores. And you can introduce yourself, Miguel, and take the word. Okay. My name is Miguel Barnuevo. Um, my father has studied here in, in Louvain uh, 60 years ago in the 50s. <laughs> So I'm not so far from my home. Uh, I'm 50, 58 years old. I, I studied in the in Madrid, in the, and now I'm president of Fasalbac. It's an agriculture uh, conservation association in my region but I'm also vocal of the National Association of uh, Conservation Agriculture. And I'm always working with the Junta Central de Regantes de la Mancha Oriental. It's the organizations of irrigation farmers in Albacete. We are, we totalize uh, 120,000 hectares. Okay, I've been also president of the water jury to control the farmers uh, 10 years ago. And I've been working in the last months in the, uh, in the hydrologic uh, planification with, uh, with Anna Mono. It's, Anna is our opposite in, in the water problems in, in Albacete. And I've been working also with uh, an, an almond uh, company, and I collaborate with UPA in, in, in some experiences uh, uh, and project. My I, I began to be farmer in the 80s, and my experience is uh, I, I began with no tillage in 1993 and in, in dry plots. Now I'm, uh, I began with irrigation plots in 2000, and my whole farm is working in agricultural, in conservation agriculture. I don't plow. It, uh, in 50 years, in 20 years, I, I haven't plowed my, my land. And with this experience, I've been working, now I'm working to other farmers. I make the seeding service in no tillage system for 1,000 hectares. So I have a little experience with corn, uh, barley, uh, and so on. Uh, a little experience. The they have make a resume. Uh, I have to note uh, to the resume. I've been impacted with uh, the strategic plans, and one one of the, um, the 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 farmers are very much worried about the new strategic plan and the eco schemes because it's a new new way to see uh, farming. I mean, I've been working in, with the Ministry of our association in the eco schemes and lines. And in Spain, I can say that there are eight lines and three are no tillage cover and two for cover crops. So the line in Spain is going to a conservation agriculture. We have to cover our soils because we are uh, losing our soils. We, we have a, a big problem with, with erosion. And uh, in water, I, my experience is I'm a farmer who comes from, from a, um, a typical situation in Spain, drought land, uh, low yields, low expectations, 
and I, be, I became a, a radiation farmer in 80, in the 90s. So it's, a, it's another vision of, of farming. The, in the future in, in our country, we need the irrigation. The problem we have is uh, now we have a climate change. We have uh, droughts longer than before. And we have to manage the water because we are reaching a limit of use of, of farmers. The problem is there's no more water and we are reaching our top level of surface of uh, irrigation. So that uh, brings out us many problems because there are little fights within, uh, within us. We, we have to make an effort to manage this situation because in the next years we, have, we are going to have uh, big problems. Uh, one of the questions uh, for me is more important to manage the soil than the improvement in the irrigation systems. Because when you manage, you make a good manage of soil, you improve more than you can believe your yields, your, uh, your soil conservation, the inputs, you, your costs are lower, and my obsession are not the yields, it's the conservation of my land for the next generation. Okay, thank you. I can give the word to uh, Tim Hess, who also can so two or three qualities, right? You have with two hats at least today. of Water and Food Systems at Cranfield University uh, in the UK, um, and I've been there a, a very long time, as you can tell by my grey hair, um, and I, I guess I've had a very varied academic career um, at, at the university there, but the, the common theme has been the relationship between agriculture, food production, and water. Um, so I, I started my my research career actually working in flood risk management uh, and agriculture and about the impact of flooding uh, on farmers and the effect of excess water uh, on, on the eco economics of, of farm businesses. Um, and, and I still have an interest in flood risk management um, and particularly about how land management can influence flood risk management. So I was interested in the presentation earlier about impacts on runoff generation uh, and how we can use agricultural land not just to produce food, but also to, to manage uh, the hydrological environment. Uh, and over time, I gradually started moving away from working in too much water to what happens when we don't have enough water and started getting involved in, in irrigation and irrigation management um, and worked a lot with UK farmers on irrigation management over the years. Uh, but also, uh, most of my international experience has been uh, in Africa, particularly Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, and, and some parts of West Africa, and then a few other uh, places ar around the world, but mostly uh, in Africa, uh, and also working quite a lot with the, the commercial horticulture and plantation sector. So not so much working with small-scale farmers in Africa, but working with uh, sugarcane industry, uh, working with companies that are producing export vegetables for the European market. So p people who are irrigating on a very large scale. Um, and more recently, m my interests and research interests have been moving more towards um, how we can sustainably feed ourselves, whether that's on a national or a global perspective, particularly in relation to water uh, and the impact of food production and food consumption uh, on the water environment around the world. So we've been working with water footprints uh, 
and particularly looking at how consumption of fruit and vegetables in the UK uh, is impacting on water resources around the world. We import 70% of our fruit, we import 50% of our vegetables, um, and we import those fruits and vegetables from countries which are dry. So large amount coming from Spain, but also from Israel, South Africa, Chile, uh, Morocco. So you know, the one common factor those countries have is that they're all very dry countries. So what impact are we having through our fruit consumption on those countries, but also to what extent is our supply of fruit vulnerable to drought and water scarcity in those countries? Um, so how is our diet vulnerable to, to those countries? So yeah, my academic career has sort of covered a very wide range of, of topics, all of which have come up in the presentations this morning, which has been, been fascinating for me. The, the other hat um, that I'm wearing today is uh, I was invited to come along to represent the UK irrigation sector. Um, and I thought it might be useful just to say a little bit about irrigation in the UK. Because when, when I ask people to picture what a farm in UK looks like, everybody thinks of something that's very wet. Uh, we've got problems with mud. Uh, we've got problems with tractors getting stuck in the field because it's too wet. Uh, and they don't think about irrigation as being part of the UK uh, agricultural system. Um, and you're largely right, but occasionally, in certain places and certain times, irrigation is absolutely critical. Um, our, our water abstractions for irrigation uh, in the UK accounts for about 1% of our annual water abstractions. They're absolutely tiny on a national scale. You know, most of our water abstraction is for domestic use and for industry. Um, and on average, uh, that a total abstraction is about 180 million cubic meters of water per year. That's probably less than your farmers <laughs> in, your, in your one region of, of Spain is using. Uh, and, but if that was the end of the story, then I could just leave the room now and get the Eurostar and go home because I wouldn't have anything to contribute. Um, but actually, the UK irrigation sector is really important for our um, vegetable production, particularly potatoes and root vegetables. Um, almost 80% of our irrigation uh, goes on to potatoes or carrots uh, and other vegetable crops. Very little of our cereal crop is irrigated, although this year I've seen farmers irrigating cereals because it's been dry and, of course, the price of wheat has gone very high. So farmers who've got water and got equipment have been irrigating their cereal crops this year, but that's, that's quite unusual. Um, most of it is going on to, say, potatoes, vegetables, and high-value horticultural crops. But geographically, that irrigation is very much concentrated in one region of the UK. So about 80% of the irrigation is taking place in the eastern and southeastern part of the UK, which is the driest part of the UK. Uh, and I remind people that Eastern England has the same average annual rainfall as Jerusalem. Now, it's slightly misleading because Jerusalem gets it in one season. We get it <laughs> uniformly distributed over the whole year. But around 600 millimetres per year is the average annual rainfall uh, in Eastern England. So it is a dry part of the world. So we're growing our irrigation-intensive crops in the driest part of the country, uh, and at some times of the year, and I imagine this week will be one of those times, actually abstractions for irrigation is the major water uh, abstraction in the eastern counties of England. So although across the whole country, across the whole year, it's only 1%, at some times uh, it can be the biggest abstraction. So, so it is important to UK agriculture, it's important to the UK economy, and it's important to UK farmers. What's challenging the UK irrigating farmers at the moment is, is about securing their share of the water and their access to water. Um, perhaps because agriculture is only taking 1% on average, it has a small voice. Uh, it's not able to defend its requirement for water uh, in, on the national stage. That eastern part of England, where most of the uh, irrigation is taking place, uh, the catchments there are predominantly classified as either over-abstracted uh, or 
over-licensed. So that means that either we're already abstracting too much water uh, for, for what is sustainable, or if everybody was to abstract everything they have a license to abstract, it would be unsustainable, but not everybody is abstracting it. So that means it's very difficult for farmers in those regions to get a license to abstract any more water or to expand their business, because they're, they're right at the limit. Uh, and the environment agency that manage water abstractions is actually trying to remove licenses from some farmers in some areas to reduce the abstraction, particularly during dry periods. Um, the environmental impacts of over abstraction uh, are unacceptable. And so farmers who are not using their license or not using all of their water uh, are seeing that they're having their licenses uh, taken away. Climate change, of course, is, is a consideration. Uh, the projections for climate change for uh, south and east of UK are for hotter, drier summers um, and wetter winters. So two problems, needing more irrigation water in the summer uh, and causing more runoff in the winter, leading to more flooding in the winter. So perhaps the, the, the double whammy uh, coming from the climate change projections. On a national scale, the, the key question in relation to climate change and water demand is not how much water we need per hectare, but how many hectares of crops are we going to grow and where are we going to grow them. And actually looking back over the last 20 years, total national demand for irrigation water has gone down because we are eating less potatoes, so we're growing less potatoes, so we're irrigating less potatoes. The, the national diet has become more cosmopolitan. Uh, we don't just eat fish and chips now, we are eating <laughs> pasta and we are eating rice, which we are importing from, from other parts of the world. Uh, so actually our demand for irrigation has gone down. But as if we start to produce more of our own uh, potatoes again, more of our own vegetables, more of our own fruits, then the demand for irrigation will be going up. And there's some interesting sort of international questions about should we be reliant on water resources in other countries to feed people in, in Britain? Uh, or should we be using our own water to, to do that? Um, but the other big challenge to the UK irrigators is demand for water from other sectors. So not only is the eastern and southern part of England the area where we have most irrigation uh, and most water demand, but it's the area of greatest population growth and new housing development. So that there's a potential conflict between water supply for domestic production, uh, for domestic use, for houses, taking away water for farmers. Of course, to politicians, the, the housing and the population growth is much more powerful than giving water to farmers. So in reaction to that, farmers are starting to work together, to collaborate together, to have a stronger voice, uh, to defend their position, but also to share access to water resources. Um, and we're starting to see shared reservoirs, uh, farmers sharing licenses, being able to give excess water to neighbors when they have too much, or borrow water from neighbors when they have too little. But traditionally, farmers have irrigated on their own, but now they're starting to, to collaborate, really to defend themselves against these challenges of losing water. Okay. That's a bit of context. Thanks so much, Tim. <laughs> and now I, we have the, have the word to Professor Dick Ras. He, he's in the table for several reasons, but he can explain by himself. One of them is his broad expert, expertise. Okay, thank you. So I'm Dirk Ras from the from Belgium actually, from the University of Leuven and from the same department as uh, Gabriel actually. But meanwhile I'm already retired, but I still have some assignments at the university. So I was a professor teaching irrigation, although like England we don't have much irrigation <laughs> in Belgium, but I studied irrigation in, in Italy, in Bari, and I was also, uh, I spent some uh, three years in Algeria uh, working there at an institute and then four years in Senegal for uh, managing the water uh, at the Senegal River actually. So I have some experience in, in irrigation and then at uh, KU Leuven, at our university, we have our regular students but we also have an international master 
which is uh, Youpware, Water Resources Engineering, together with Brussels, we run that. And then we have students uh, from all over the world. So, um, and then I got also a lot of projects all over the world uh, with different funding, most of them always in irrigation and most of them in the dry areas. Maybe my second hat, if you like, is that <laughs> I also work close uh, with uh, FAO, with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And FAO, as you know, is not a, a research institute. But FAO was looking at for a model, actually, in, in, uh, for to giving advice to farmers uh, when there is water scarcity. So they would like to have some a model which can uh, easily produce guidelines to improve the water productivity or just uh, give guidelines for irrigation scheduling or also for effects of climate change. So FAO set up uh, in the early years 2000 some meetings with, uh, with um, a lot of crop modelers from all over the world and uh, with other scientists involved in irrigation. And out of that came then the idea, so let's make not because there are a lot of good crop models, actually, like TSAT, CROPSIS, TWOFOS, whatever, but all of those are mainly research models working by, by a research institute. And FAO said, we don't need a research model. We need something practical, actually, but which is, of course, strong, which has a strong science in it, uh, soil sciences, irrigation sciences, plant sciences, all, all that in it. So uh, with some people from different universities, so we developed then the aqua crop model, and which was then uh, for FAO actually. And the good thing is that uh, FAO used that model in a lot of, in, in his projects and also in training. So we went to different countries to give training and the training is always with the local people and, and, and with the people from ministries and, and and these are not researchers, so we, you need you spend some time in explaining how things work because they have no idea about modeling, but they have a lot of questions about the field. And that is a very good thing because that helps us to develop, and I think also Rosanna mentioned it, the model becomes more and more fit to the local needs, actually, because you can have a nice solution for something, but which is not practical, uh, you, you, it's not good. So with the help of the local knowledge that was brought in the model, but also, of course, with the help of uh, PhD students, um, a lot of, of information and field experiments uh, were set up to uh, improve the, the, the simulation, actually, in the models. And now, uh, recently, uh, the group van Gabriele put it in a, made it a regional model, because aquacrop is a field model, and so, uh, where it can be linked with other models and new applications becomes available as well. And that will be discussed, as Gabriel was saying, uh, at the end of the month with FAO. So, how are we going to distribute that, actually? So, that, that's me. That's Fantastic. <laughs> and now I give the, the word to Anna Ferrer. Sorry for not remembering. She comes from, also from the eastern part of the country. And you can introduce yourself, Anna, please. Thank you. Yes, my name is Ana Ferrer and I'm a lawyer and my career, my professional career has been linked from the beginning to the world of water, advising the irrigation community. I am a member of the legal advisory body of uh, the National Federation of Irrigation Communities that is a non-profit association that uh, gets together more than 700,000 irrigators and more than uh, 2 million hectares, representing 80% of the Spanish uh, irrigated land. And uh, since uh, 2000, 2005, I have been working in La Cequia Real del Júcar, um, where I carry out uh, management and administrative functions. And uh, La Cequia Real del Júcar is one of the oldest uh, communities, irrigation communities in Spain. It has been managed water for more than 750 years. <laughs> and um, its, um, it's um, 
taking part of the community more than 25,000 irrigators from different municipalities in the east of Spain. And also uh, the um, irrigable area is um, 20,500 hectares of different crops, rice, citrus, fruit trees, and orchards, traditionally watered by flooding. But in the 2000 years, uh, we, be, we started our modernization plan, um, switching to, to flooding irrigation to drip irrigation. And now we have more than 6,000 hectares representing 36% of our irrigable area. And I wanted to, to mention four of the major advantages of our modernization, that is um, water safe, of course, uh, we, we have reduced in more than 180 cubic hectometers a year. In a um, system, in a very vulnerable system, um, um, that, um, we use the, the savings uh, to correct the imbalances between uh, valuable uh, resources and existing uses, and also to reduce the impact of droughts. But we are able to reduce up to uh, 60 cubic hectometers more as our modernization process progress. And uh, that savings uh, are reserved in our um, hydrologic plan to Albufera, a natural park. It's a natural reserve, including as a Ramsar site in, uh, in the list of wetlands of international importance. So uh, we have a, a modernization committee to the environment. The second uh, advantage of our modernization is that uh, we uh, is a modernization without energy consumption um, because the pressure that we need, um, we get it by gravity uh, because our head reservoir is located uh, 40 meters above our irrigable area. And in addition, our fertilizers and irrigation um, manager centers are pressured uh, by photovoltaic energy. And uh, the third uh, characteristic feature or advantage is uh, that um, we reduce uh, the use of uh, fertilizers and herbicides uh, more by more than 50% uh, compared with flooding irrigation. And that uh, contributes to reduce the effects of diffuse contamination in an in a underground water uh, in a vulnerable area. And in addition, um, we have more than 500 uh, clean points, uh, clean water points, uh, to allow the development of um, organic um, agri um, agriculture. And um, finally, it's a modernization based on technical and digitalization, uh, because all our infrastructures are connected to a, a operation center via fiber optic, uh, Wi-Fi, and radio uh, to manage and control all the system. Our technicians um, they do their um, fertilizers and irrigation programs, taking in account the, um, the information provided by um, the conductivity and humidity sensors, and of course, uh, water meters. Invoicing um, is based on a bino binomial uh, system, a binomial tarifa, uh, according to the surface area of each plot and its consumption, and we penalize over consumption. And um, we are all, all we count with the support of the Polytechnic uh, University of Valencia, and also with um, Institute, a Valencian Institute of Agriculture Research, and, of course, with the experience of our trusted suppliers uh, to keep on improving. And all these tools managed uh, by the irrigation community allows us to optimize the use of water in our agriculture and to contribute to improve the environment in our irrigation area. Okay. Thanks so much, Anna. And your talk rise to the first question that we were preparing for the round table for you, and is up to what point the technical uh, fixes or the technical solutions can, I mean, what fraction of the problems related to water can be solved only with technical solutions that are great, and what part remains in other fields like governance or 
other issues. So I, will, I, I think we all want, would like to know what are your thoughts on this. Uh, who wants to start? I think the main problem is governance, the first. Because now in, in Spain we are arriving to the top of consumption of water in irrigation. There's no more water. Technically, we are good, good uh, farmers. But the, the, the question is how many water, uh, what is, uh, what, how many water have you had in your license to irrigate? Because it's not the same farming with uh, 1,000 1, meters hectare than farming with uh, 5,000 meters hectare. The investments are there, but you are, you, you, you are not going to, to make an investment for 1,000 meters hectares. You're losing. The second question, uh, technically we are arriving with sensory re remote sensing and we are arriving to see when where we are uh, efficient, more efficient or not in our plots. This is the, f the, the next uh, desafio, the, 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 next, the next challenge because we are reaching a very good results with the recommendations of the agronomic institutes and the recommendations are very good now, are very, uh, when you know your, your efficiency system, the, the, when you know the efficiency in the system, you, we irrigate very well. But the next uh, challenge is we ha I have seen in last years that with the uh, remote sensing maps, we are seeing that we are spending water in some parts of the plots that uh, we don't need to irrigate so much. We have to, to spray the water better in the, in the, in, in the plot. We can save the, with these techniques, uh, I think 10%, 50% of water and make uh, them more profitable. Because in the problem, one of the problems now is our, uh, our cost. They are, they are very high. You know the cost of energy, the fertilizers, pesticides, has grown twice, okay? Now to make farming is very risky and more risky in irrigation farming because the risk is a double. Uh, my experience this year is I have seeded less hectares in corn hectares in Albacete because the farmer has no the money to pay the, the energy. He wants to sit, but he doesn't want, and the risk is very high. I'm very worried about this because I think we had a problem of uh, food security in these moments. Uh, mainly in Spain because we have to import many tons of cereal each year to food our uh, our animals, uh, uh, pigs, uh, corn, uh, um, cows, etc., sheep. And we are uh, in the, in, now in the in the sites where they are. Um, fixing the prices, las lonjas, they are very big discussions of our prices because too, uh, too high prices are not, uh, the people can't, uh, f can't buy with these high prices. So, uh, 
perhaps in irrigation systems, uh, we are reaching in Spain a good governance. Now we are discussing with the government how many water is for farmers. The discussion is very hard because in Spain, one of the problems was that uh, the rivers were not flowing. The humid areas were dried. And now the society and the government wants to uh, keep these areas more uh, natural and with more water. Rivers needs water. This area needs water, but that, uh, that means that the farmers, we are going to have less water. If you are not organized, it's war. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I... That means war between farmers it, and between administration. It, it looks like you pinpoint something similar to what you said <laughs> uh, in southern, in, in southeastern England, in England, and do other of the experts in the table, any of you, think also like Miguel that governance is a major issue or need to be balanced or you did, for instance? Yes, yes, I think so. Because technically, it's a little bit like climate change. So technically, we know how to solve it, actually. But it is the policy, the governance, uh, the, who has to make the decisions. And uh, they are hesitating to do that because it might hurt people. So technically, the, and, and for water, uh, there was a very interesting, I think it was you presenting the deficit irrigation. So it's a very interesting, and, and it is proven, and, and, and I would like to see you work as well, that uh, with the same amount of water, you can easily produce 40, 50% more food with the same amount of water. But the problem is that a farmer is not interested in deficit irrigation because a farmer is interested in the production of his field and he would, have, would like mm. to have the maximum production. He never go for deficit irrigation because he will have a lower production. So you have to, to, to bring the farmers in one way or another together. And as, an, as a scientist or researchers, we cannot do that. So it is somewhere government, local government or whatever, who should bring the farmers together and say, in this community, this is the amount of water we have. So let's divide it so that we can produce 40% more food so that the whole community will benefit from it. So I think technically they are not, uh, they, are, they are still of course challenges and there are always new things coming up, but it is, you need to implement it. And if, if you may allow me, that is also a little bit the, the good thing about aqua crop, actually, that it is not a research model as such. Of course, there is a lot of science in it, and thanks to researchers like uh, Shannon and, and, and uh, Louise, we bring in new things, and, 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 and Gabriele now made it also a regional model. But the good thing of FAO is that they give the training always in request of the country. So FAO is never going to make a project, it's always the country ask for, for a project, actually, for a, a practical uh, problem they have. So, for example, we had a big study in West Africa about the effect of climate change. They wanted to know that, and therefore, aqua crop is, is uh, we used aqua crop. And the people following the training, these are not researchers, these are not people from the universities, these are people from the Ministry of Waters or of Agriculture or things like that. So we. With, with, with the training, we give them tools, actually, and it's up to them then uh, to apply them. So I think that, indeed, uh, the main problem is always, uh, yeah, how are you going to implement it? And we as scientists cannot do that. I yeah. um, think going, going, it looks like in the UK, going back to this governance, key issue, I don't know if you agree that that's the major one, it looks from what you said that it's, Basically, the, the reorganization around the water rights is made by farmers by themselves. Or is the government try to lead that? Or um, yeah, okay. The, the is technology the answer? Is governance the answer? Um, they're both the answer, but they're answer to different questions. Uh, and I think one thing we always need to be very careful of when we're talking about problems of water scarcity 
is to actually unpick what the question is uh, and who is it important to. So maybe if you're, if you're a farmer uh, and you have a fixed supply of water from a reservoir, which is not enough to irrigate your area, then a technology answer to make you more efficient may be the perfect solution. If the problem is that at the basin scale there's not enough water to go round, then technology is not the answer and it's governance that's the answer. And the, the layers of the different systems of technology, management and governance all, all have to operate together. Um, and I was just going to give an example of how technology may not always help. Um, I was just a couple of weeks ago on a big commercial vegetable farm in West Africa where roughly half the farm was centre pivots and half the farm was drip irrigation. Uh, and on the centre pivots, they are putting about 30% more water than they need to put onto the crop. On the drip irrigation, they're putting about 50% more water than they need to put on the crop. So they irrigate, over-irrigating much more with the higher technology, so-called more efficient drip irrigation system than they are with the pivots. Because it's the way that it's being managed that's the, the problem, and the efficiency is entirely determined by the management system, not the technology. Um, so, yeah, put, and now putting that question back into the UK context, yes, it is governance which is the, really, the, the big issue at the moment. Um, but it links into technology and efficiency and management as well, because in the, the way that the Environment Agency is approaching the reform of the abstraction system, they are putting pressure on farmers to demonstrate that they're using water sensibly in order to be able to renew their irrigation licenses. So farmers are uh, having to demonstrate that they are using the right amount of water, that they're scheduling it properly, they're using appropriate technologies to then be able to re renew their license. So the governance system is then actually forcing the technology system to improve, improve yeah. well. So it's all linked together. In Spain, when you, you, you ask for subsidies to modernization, you have to improve your, uh, your Los ahorros. the savings. You have to improve. You are obliged if, if you're not, you have not subsidies. So it's uh, when they are doing this uh, this modernization in 60,000 60, hectares, they have to demonstrate that it's there is a saving. You know, you don't have no money. Um, you said that we scientists don't know, but we have two in the corners and one of them. Anna. Your experience is one of the experiences in Spain that is very interesting because you, try, you need to manage two things, technology and governance, but also there is this big discussion on what to do with the savings. And actually, I would like to know, because usually sometimes the savings goes for more irrigation, but in your case, it wasn't the case, right? When we started the modernization, the first uh, 180 hectare cubic hectometers went to the system uh, just to, to correct the imbalances that we had. And we noticed that because we had reduced the impact of droughts also. So, um, um, and now it's also a question of, of policy also and the influence of the ecologists because they are asking for more water for our Albufera Natural Park, for example, and I'm not sure if it's necessary or not. So, uh, amount of water to improve the lake, because it's not only a question of quantity, but quality, because it's uh, a pollution water, and so, but I um, agree with. Uh, Two years ago, we pacted that that savings uh, are going to the system. We're going to the system, to other farmers, to their irrigation lands. Now, the, the stakeholders, the policy, policy stakeholders, had decided that these savings are going to the river and to the albufera. We are not so happy because we are in, in Albacete. One part of these savings were going to Albacete. But now they have decided 
that these savings are going to the Albufera. We are not so happy because, but um, it's policy. In the middle, we have the politicians that, and that you have mentioned it, the ecologists are very influenceable in our policy stakeholders now. So, I, I don't I don't like the the word, but it seems that we are fighting with uh, ecologists with uh, these uh, temps. It's not our intention, but they are sometimes very radical in in his positions. So it seems that we are in war, but mm, the first. Uh, the first people interested in doing doing well are, are the farmers. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, this this issue about how, what to do with the water, and it is probably changing because of the prediction of availability due to, in some areas of the world, to reduction of precipitation or increase of ET, and. That, that change in some areas can change the whole system. Um, that also means a reallocation of previous rights, right? Um, uh, that's how, that, that's probably what is behind in Spain too, right? It's, mm. it's but in our region, the problem is not the average rain, it's the temperature because it's growing now in Albacete, we have two degrees more than the medium. That means more evapotranspiration and more days evapotranspiring. So we have, uh, we have less water in the system. But there's no, we, can, we cannot say now if it rains more or less because we have a, a Mediterranean climate that is very regular. So we will see that in 20 or 30 years with the, with the VASA date, dates in, in 30 years. But my impression is the problem is the, te the temperature. Well, I, I have heard about uh, something which is happening in, in Egypt, actually. So they use the water of the Nile mainly to irrigate rice. Rice crop is very important because that's the stable food as well. But as we all know, rice consumes a tremendous amount of water. And if you compare the water use efficiency, the amount of yield per cubic meter of water with other crops, uh, other crops like just vegetables, of course, are much more profitable, you can produce much more uh, food uh, vegetables than, than rice with, with, with that water. So what I have heard, uh, I've never seen it published, but people were talking about it, that in Egypt people are saying, oh, let's use the water for the Nile River now to grow pre uh, preferable uh, vegetables which on top we can sell to the Middle East, and they give us a lot of dollars for it. And rice, we can buy it very cheap from Cambodia and Thailand, where it is rain-fed. So they are shifting, actually, the use of water uh, from rice to, to another crop, mainly also for economic reasons, of course. But so there is a shift, indeed, going on. I can't agree with that in my <laughs> from my <laughs> perspective, because Rice is, uh, in our area, it's um, linked with environment, uh, necessarily. Also because all the Albufera Natural Park is bordered by uh, rice land. And uh, it's growing or is feeding uh, from the rice land, so that's uh, the end of our, <laughs> our lake. So it's not only the, the agriculture point of view, it's also an environment issue. So. Um, where it, 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 I still am not very 
I don't have the perception that we have all the issues regarding waters in dry countries. Uh, I'm not the best one in thinking about that. Um, <laughs> what may happen if we are not able to address this? If we leave, we have some examples in areas of the world where it's, we reach uh, the limit if we don't address the issue of more or less not stretching the limits. So what may happen if some of the issues that we know in our areas are not fully addressed? Of water. Yeah, like over extractions or absolutely getting out of wells or, yeah. Just try to be, I mean, yes, I you, you are a pretty good example of Spain. places in Spain that are doing pretty well, but it's, in, in we have our other picture in the Mediterranean. In Spain, we arrive. We have just arrived to this. We have uh, over over uh, sobre explotation. So, uh, sobre explotations in many areas. The conflicts now are there with uh, irrigation farmers because the new plants, hydrologic plants, they are forbidden to farmers to 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 irrigate, but it's a question also, uh, one of the problems are the underground, the groundwater, because our, we have to, to study more the movements and the possibilities of groundwater. We, but do we have to be a little, uh, um, Prudentes, careful. careful, because in some regions of Spain, there are many people pumping water. And when the, in the policy, the government doesn't uh, uh, do anything, there's a problem. We have to, um, but there's a, a question also, that the, use, the users, farmers, have to participate in the governance of water. The sample here is that uh, I'm uh, from a region in inland in, in Albacete and Ana is in, in Valencia. And the experience is we have to collaborate to study the problem. Perhaps we don't like the solution of the other but we have to make a big effort because if the farmers don't, don't collaborate in the governance, we are, we are loose. It's, 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 it's mainly, it's, it's basically, I think. We have a lot of possibilities to improve in our area because we have uh, also use uh, treated wastewater. And also in our area, the um, groundwater has a lot of possibilities because uh, we, we irrigate with uh, superficial water. So um, we, have, we, we can do change uh, of some rights uh, with other users. We can change our rights. And also we can get deals about uh, give some of our rights depending of the year um, and our law do, do the possibility to do many, many things. And you were going to say something too. Yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of lift it from yeah. local scales to global scales and are, are we going to run out of water to feed ourselves um, because we have climate change reducing water availability in most of the agricultural producing areas of the world. We have growing populations who are increasingly eating more rich diets which are more water intensive. And so on a global scale we need to feed the, the future populations we will need much more water unless we do things differently. Um, and, and I'm fairly optimistic that we will do things differently both in, on the side of production um, and you know, all sorts of clever things like, like vertical farming and recycling water within closed systems um, and also in consumption. I think the example we saw from UK about you know, how much water it takes to provide us with our starchy carbohydrates as our diet has shifted from potatoes to much more rice 
massively increase the amount of water. If I can encourage all of my friends to eat more potatoes and eat less <laughs> rice, we can massively reduce the global water demand. So that there are going to be dietary changes uh, which will happen in the future. You know, some foods will just become very expensive and people will eat less of them. People's diets will change. There's generally a move towards increasing vegetarian or flexitarian diets, which can reduce the amount of water that's required to produce those foods. Now, not in all cases, and I'm, I'm a big opponent of people saying we must become vegetarian to save the world's water resources, because it's not quite as simple as that. But we, in 30 years' time, I think we'll look back on the way we produce food and the food we consume and say, God, didn't we do things in a funny way back in 2022? Yeah, just maybe uh, to agree with Tim, actually, that globally there is, of course, not a problem at all. Uh, if you calculate with the Falkmark index, that's an index who says that a person needs about, I think it's around 4,800 liters per day per person, and that is 70% of the water is for food production, 20 for industry, and 10% in the household. So that's four, four, close to 5,000 liters you need. If you count that with a population of 11 billion, you still use only 15% of all the fresh water in the world in one year, actually, which comes by rain. But here, of course, the, the big issue is that it is not fairly <laughs> distributed, neither in time, neither in, in place, of course. And, and uh, I'm sure that as, as, as already mentioned before, there are technical solutions for everything, actually, but the thing is you need pressure for people to, to, to take them. Just to, to give you an, an example, Tim was also mentioning uh, in, in that drip is, is using more water than, than the, the pivots in, in uh, Senegal, actually. I, we were recently with Louise, actually, in, in Tunisia, and there we learned that uh, Thanks to solar energy, now farmers has a cheap energy actually for pumping water. So instead of using gasoline, now they use uh, solar energy. And they see now that the water consumption for drip increases, <laughs> actually. <laughs> so they, they are misusing it, actually, because for the moment there is not a, a too big constraint. But if constraints will come, solutions are there. And there is enough water, actually. That the issue really is an energy issue more than a water issue because also the desalination that we're seeing in some parts of the most water scarce world can become a solution for water and make it not a problem at all as long as the energy source is there to, to make it cheap enough to happen. So I'd like to, 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 to ask why I haven't heard anybody say anything about desalination yet. Well, for desalinization, I don't believe uh, to produce water for food production, actually. Because uh, a field, it depends, of course, in which country you are, in which climate you are, if it is, uh, it needs roughly a few million liters of water per hectare uh, during the growing cycle. And if you have to produce that by desalinization, that's impossible, even if energy is extremely cheap. So, Desalinization definitely for industry, maybe because they are economic strong, or, or for, for domestic I, use. I, I definitely, because then we are talking about a few hundred liters of water a but day. Think about an even bigger picture. Desalination can dictate what the actual value of water is because it's creating new water. So the cost of desalination and delivering that water to agriculture can become the value of water that then di dictates the economics around decision making for what you're growing and how, it, how you're growing. We see it happening already in Israel that we don't desalinate for agriculture, we, but half of our water going to municipalities have become desalinated water, so it's very important to the water economy and therefore to the entire e economy and it's dictated the price, the actual value of, wa uh, of water. And then it changes how farmers make decisions because the water becomes more valuable than it used to be. But if, our water, if we're not going to have water, then 
that value is going to go up, right? When you have no water, the value is infinite. So, so again, I do think it can, we can scale up. Israel's very small, so our large scale is still a small amount relatively of, of desalination. But I could imagine that. I think we're starting to see it happening in the south of Spain and in the, the yes. east of Italy and in some mm -hmm. of Australia as well. The most water-scarce places that have economies that can think about changing things to make things expensive, right? No, no the, the salinization in Murcia uh, in, the, in the south is beginning to, to function. The problem was the cost. But now with uh, photovoltaic energy, they are arriving to make a low cost. The next problem is that you have to mix this water with uh, the natural water because we have problems with some um, salts, uh, boro, and there's, you have to mix the water. But uh, for Murcia now is the solution. They have cut the trasvase Tajo Segura. It's, uh, it's water bring it from the in, in Spain, from uh, uh, 500 kilometers from the la, la Sierra de, de, bueno, de, de Cuenca. And they have limited this uh, amount of water to 300 hectometers, but they are supplying with uh, the salinate water in uh, the amount of, of, of water. We are doing it. The problem is the cost, energy cost, but they are arriving now to, to low the, the cost and is, is, is profitable the, now. Yeah, I think he also that, that uh, desalinization as such, maybe not, not, not for agriculture, I don't believe so much in it, but well, as he mentioned, the mixing, of course, of slight saline water with fresh water, and then there will be another shift is two other types of crops which, which can uh, support uh, better the, the salt, like, for example, barley or something like that to grow that. But still, there is the problem of on the long term that you get anyway salinity problems on the long term become stronger and stronger unless there is some flushing. So it means you will need more water actually to clean it or you need winter rains which can le leach it out of the soil. This also is a, a problem of infrastructures but, but because sometimes uh, the stations are far away from the irrigable area. So you have yeah. to invest also in infrastructures and the farmers cannot allow the cost. So. No, I, th I think that in, in general the, the question is, uh, okay, uh, um, uh, is necessary to apply science technology, is it necessary to apply the salinization, all of the things, and sometimes in the, in the table say it's not, it's not necessary maybe because, uh, for instance, the farmer uh, wants to produce maximum, so it's not very interested in regular deficit regulation. And it's true, of, of course, uh, but the problem is in some areas. No, no, every world has enough water. So in some specific areas, Israel, Murcia, some, uh, in, in this place, nobody likes to, to use uh, wastewater, to uh, wastewater treated uh, to, no, no, everybody prefer to, to use a wonderful water <laughs> uh, uh, for, for, for irrigation. The problem is that there is not water for that. Uh, so or you apply technology, or you apply desalinization, or you use wastewater, or, or, or you don't produce. Okay, you can say, well, don't produce. Uh, you, you can modify your, your economy, yes, but this is difficult sometimes, because, uh, for instance, in Murcia, uh, well, uh, I don't know, but the, the importance of the, of the production, agricultural production, crop production is very high, and you must um, try to maintain this. So I think that uh, these technologies, maybe I don't know if at, at world scale, is something that you can promote 
but uh, in some areas it's clear that it's necessary to apply because in other way you, you, you must finish with the, with the, with the system of, of crop that, that, that you have. Well, in Murcia is, is true. Now they are trying to, to use the, the salinization. Well, you, you explained very well. The problem is that it's expensive. I think that is not a problem. Of, I think that uh, sometimes the farmers also look for some, some, uh, some I don't know, problems that there are. No, no, is this water is not very good because it's not, has, not, it has a lot of water. No, I think that the problem is that it's very expensive, uh, of course, of to of tea, no? and they prefer to use the water for uh, the river or for the transfer or something like that. But uh, I think that this is a solution if, obviously, uh, we can reduce the, the crop production. And again, um, what's more important, governance or technology? I think that is very difficult. So uh, the governance is very, very important to apply the technology. If you, if you have a very good technology and there is not a good, uh, a good system of governance for, to apply, some, 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 <coughs> some push for the politician or something like that to apply, maybe it's not doing. But also, of course, the only, only with the governance of the water, in some specific cases, when you have no water, you need uh, you need technology, so it's, it's not very. It's, it depends of the area. Maybe sometimes it's better the technology. Well, I am working technology, so I prefer technology than government. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's not good thing. One one thing important: the price of the water. Yeah. He has said that uh, the, with the desalination uh, desalinization water was very expensive. The problem in Murcia that the water was uh, coming from the inland of Spain was very cheap. See. The, see. You are from inland Spain. Yes. <laughs> no. And when you put a low price to water, you are pushing the people to use water with no limits. So you have to reach uh, society, politicians, uh, the stakeholders in our communities. We have to put a real price to water. Because if you don't put this, uh, this price, people uh, is going to, going to, to bad use water uh, or to to spray what to, to use, <laughs> not to use good the water. One of the problems w was in Spain, the Trasvase Tajo Segura, the price was 25 centimes euro meter cubic, I think. Okay, the desalin salinization water uh, is uh, one euro meter cubic. So the farmer was used to a low water price. When you have to tell him you have to pay this, I don't want. But they make a farming that allows to pay this cost. They will uh, win less, but, but they are profit, profitable. In, the, in this special farming, eh? uh, uh, vegetables for Europe uh, and, and, and not in citrus, not in almonds, but in, in, in lettuce, vegetables, uh, cucumbers. Yeah, I, I think that this is a, a, a local uh, situation. I don't know if it's extrapolable to more areas in the world, I suppose, yes. But uh, many, yeah. Uh, but of course, the, the price of the water is, is, is very important, yeah. Uh, very important, and there are some crops that maybe you can, uh, you can pay more for the water than another, no. I, I, I agree with you in, in, in the most of the things, but not that the water of the transfer is very, very cheap. It's, 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 it's more cheap, it's cheaper than, than the salinization, because of course, uh, 30 percent, but 30 cents of, 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 of cubic meter, 
uh, is, uh, you, you know the price, the price in, in Andalusia, and it's uh, cheaper. Uh, I don't know if you paid 30 cents. I don't know how much. Yeah, yeah, the price of the community. No, no, but, but it's not, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, but. Yeah. No. Anyway, yes. The the price is 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 very important. Maybe the government, the the govern the, the 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 governance is 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 very important to to fix this kind of of price and to uh, to help maybe the farmers if they cannot uh, 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 obtain this 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 money or or, or to change the the crops uh, to to make uh, crops more more um, uh, more uh, profitable. Is you are right. It's, it's true. But 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 the Murcia, I think that is. Uh, I don't know if well, in, in Israel maybe you have sim similar problems. That's something we try to transmit this morning, but it's to the table to discuss. Uh, we are reaching almost the, the one hour and thirty limit, and I think it's a good time for the four of you in the table if you want to say some final comment or final remarks or some idea that was missing and you want to leave on the table before we adjourn. So we can start now from you, Anna, so we change sides. Uh, I think it, it has been a very interesting uh, journey. Um, uh, the resume is uh, both things, uh, technology and governance, at, at least in my area, are important uh, to get improved, uh, get improving, and I don't have to say most things. Uh, you talk about fertilizers, and of course, in drip irrigation, it's um, uh, helping us uh, to to reduce the consume of water also because they are very expensive now, and the old farmers are asking for less water only to save uh, money. So uh, it depends on, on the area. We have a lot of tools. We have many things to do to improve, and. Uh, we will need the support of all of you. <laughs> um, thank you. I, I, I think most of things were said. Uh, just a small thing about the fertilizers, which is of course another constraint, uh, if there is uh, next to the water. And then maybe an interesting I thought, I don't know so much about, well, about deficit irrigation actually. So. If you apply deficit irrigation, you put your crop under some stress and he is going to transpire less and is going to make less uh, biomass actually, but of course more yield, that's what we need. So you need also less fertilizers actually. So deficit irrigation is not only saving water, but also saving fertilizers because you need less, less canopy to develop. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think a really important take-home message is that we have lots and lots of tools, whether they're technology tools or governance tools. Um, but before we can use those tools, we really need to know what's the problem we're trying to solve. Um, and wa water, water scarcity, water issues is at the centre of a number of complex systems social system, a food system, an energy system, an environmental system, and they're all interacting with each other. And you sort of push here and something pops out there, and you push here and it pops out there. Um, you know, we talk about raising the price of water. Well, that means the price of food's gonna go up. And we all know at the moment what's happening to the price of food. And that means that people who are less able to afford food go hungry. So moving a lever to increase efficient use of water here is creating poverty and hunger over here. Um, and yet yeah, the, the difficulty is trying to understand how all of these systems interrelate and they all interrelate differently at different scales, whether it's in a local community scale or a global scale. Um, yeah. if, if we had very cheap energy and we could desalinate water and we could pump it for nothing, then we'd all be out of a job. I mean, we're almost <laughs> out of a job already. Um, but I think there's, I think everybody in the room will still be in a job for uh, a long time. Yeah. Yeah. For me, the experience is you must, um, um, 
you have to have mar more farmers in these uh, researching projects because everything I come to these projects, I'm on the only farmer. You are talking about farming, you are studying farming, but there's no farmers. <laughs> And, uh, that, that, and, and that doesn't mean I'm right and I have to tell you how to investigate, to research, but sometimes uh, in the problem is that we are not participating in these projects. The problem is there's um, mainly uh, there, no, there are no farmers, uh, young farmers. The, the average age of farmers now is very high. I don't know if we are talking to no farmers in 20 years because uh, uh, behind me there's no one. In 10 years I've been uh, it's a jubilado, jubilated, <laughs> and, <laughs> and for me, it's one of the main problems. We are talking about farming, but if there are not farmers, no, no food. Okay, thank you so much. I think you summarize pretty well. <laughs> All of you, two or the three things. I mean, Rosanna raised it. But it's two or the things that makes myself uncomfortable when you see that there are some... I mean, you say we need to ask the right question, and sometimes we need to ask the right question with the right people. And I always mm -hmm. wonder what we are doing sometimes in the academic world. And the people that know me, I know this is not to make you happy, Miguel. <laughs> so uh, I think that is, it has been to me a fantastic morning. And I hope that we want to thank, I want to thank on behalf of the whole project to, to the four of you. And I think we can adjourn the round table and the, and the day. So thanks so much. Thank